डॉक्टर शिवासी शशिकांत साहू प्रोफेसर इन कार्डियोलॉजी यू एन मेहता इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ कार्डियोलॉजी एंड रिसर्च सेंटर अहमदाबाद आई विल बी प्रेजेंटिंग रिगार्डिंग क्वांटिफिकेशन ऑफ सीबेरिटी माइट्रोस्टोनोसिस बाय इको कार्डियोग्राफी आई हैव बीन गिविन ए टिपिकल क्लिनिकल सिनेरियो वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग केस आई एम जस्ट रीडिंग आउट ए 55 ईयर ओल्ड मेल स्मोकर बीइंग ट्रीटेड for copd and a known case of rheumatic heart disease presents with a dyspnea and exertion class 2 on auscultation he is having mid diastolic murmur with loud first heart sound and second heart sound the junior resident is confused as his echo outside echo report is showing mild mitral stenosis with moderate pulmonary hypertension so how do i quantify the severity of mitral stenosis using echocardiography just i am summarizing the case again 55 year old male smoker a known case of copd treated case of copd and known case of rheumatic heart disease now presenting to us as uh, a shortness of breath class 2 having mid diastolic murmur with loud s1 s2 on auscultation however the junior resident is confused with outside echo report with report of mild mitral stenosis with moderate pulmonary hypertension so how do i quantify the severity of mitral stenosis by echo one thing is very clear from this above clinical scenario that is symptoms are greater than expected for the degree of stenosis so what can be the clinical possibilities i have divided in two groups that is one patient related factors and second is echocardiography uh, related factors so what are the patient related factors point 1 55 year old male a treated case of copd that means a, a known case of moderate to severe copd according to new nice guidelines might be the cause uh, sorry might be the cause for his shortness of breath second point as he is a middle aged man and a smoker he might be harboring coronary disease cardiomyopathy or hypertensive heart disease that might be the uh, cause for his shortness of breath according to the natural history of mitral stenosis third point he might be having uh, intermittent atrial fibrillation in about 50% cases according to his age and coming to fourth point he might be truly having mild mitral stenosis but moderate pulmonary hypertension could be due to moderate to severe copd in his case now coming to second that is echocardiography related factors that could be due to inexperience of the echocardiographer in assessing valvular heart disease and secondly could be due to inherent technical difficulty while assessing in copd case due to poor transthoracic echo window and more vertical heart position in copd so how will approach echocardiographically a case of mitral stenosis with copd first i will have a assessment of valve morphology followed by assessment of severe mitral stenosis uh, first by mitral valve area calculation by planimetry pressure half time by continuity equation and by proximal isovelocity surface area method that is prisa and second is by mean transmitral pressure gradient Side side by side, I'll also assess coexisting mitral regurgitation or aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation, and assessment of LV function, both systolic and diastolic. Then assessment of RV dimension and RV function. As is a case of COPD, and assessment of uh, tricuspid uh, regurgitation velocity and pulmonary systolic pressure. First, com coming to valve morphology assessment. Uh, morphology should be assessed in M mode equal to D mode equal to D equal. and uh, i'll look for valve mor mobility valve thickening valve calcification and extent of valve pathology accordingly severity of mitral valve involvement can be scored by various uh, risk scores like uh, wilkins score cormier score padel score and etc et the motion of post mitral leaflet in diastole and there is maintenance of a fixed relationship of the two leaflets to each other throughout diastole what is the typical m mode for echo features there is reduced ef slope here and there is anterior motion of the posterior mitral leaflet in diastole and they maintain a constant relation to each other throughout diastole now uh, then what are the typical 2d echo features Uh, in diastole, in particular in Planck's view, the AML will look like hockey stick or dome shaped. There is reduced immobility, reduced mobility, posterior mitral leaflet. And in 2D, particularly in Planck's short axis, mitral valve orifice will look like fish mouth. 
and there will be enlargement of left atrium with or without thrombus. Uh, in echo, this looks like this, a 2D echo picture of metal stenosis. Uh, AMA looks like hockey stick or dome shaped. And here in 2D parasitic short axis, just looks like fixed piece mouth orifice. If transthoracic echo images are suboptimal, as could be in our case like uh, COPD, trans esophageal echo or three dimensional echo imaging can be useful uh, for mitral valve morphology assessment in such case. So, second is how will I assess severity of mitral stenosis? That is done directly by mitral valve area calculation by planimetry, then by pressure uptime method, by continuity equation, and by proximal isovelocity surface area method is PISA and indirectly by mean transmitral pressure gradient. The coming uh, to uh, cal area calculation first by uh, mitral area calculation by planimetry. Planimetry is considered as a reference measurement for mitral valve area. It is the direct measurement of mitral valve area unlike other methods. Mitral valve inflow region, particularly mitral stenosis that looks like a funnel shaped structure. So the narrowest area will be at the leaflet tips. What is the technical consideration uh, while measuring mitral valve area by planimetry? Planimetry should be done in 2D parasitic short axis view. 3D imaging allows more reproducible panel planimetry and the, the uh, Doppler beams should be scanned from left atrium to left ventricular apex to identify the smallest orifice. Identification orifice at its maximal opening in mid, uh, mid diastole. Measurement of plane uh, should be perpendicular to the mitral valve orifice, a very important point. And the gain setting should be kept at lowest. And you should trace the contour of the inner mitral valve orifice and include commissure if the commissure is open. What are the limitations? Limitations, particularly poor transthoracic echo window like COPD, obesity. Very difficult to have a proper image quality and to obtain orthogonal plane. And second is calcium. Calcium will make the tracing of the contour difficult. And third is important. If the commissure is open, then very difficult to be traced accurately. In echo, this 2D parasitic short axis echo, in planimetry, it looks like this, how we trace the border of the inner contour of the mitral valve orifice. Then come to second, that area calculation by pressure uptime method, PHT. PHT is defined as the time interval for peak pressure gradient to reach its half level. By empirical formula, it is calculated as mitral area is equal to 220 divided by pressure uptime. And measurement is done in continuous wave Doppler imaging from apical four chamber view. And PST is less dependent on heart rate and flow across the valve. So, what are the technical considerations uh, while measuring by uh, pressure of time? Number one, the intercept angle should be parallel to the flow and it should be constant throughout diastole to avoid distortion in shape of the curve. Distillation slope should be linear. In case of non-linear early distillation slope, change the position of the transducer and also angulation. If still non-linear, that is if still non-linear early distillation slope, use mid diastolic slope of the curve for PHT measurement. In atrial fibrillation, PHT is best measured from a bit with long diastolic clean interval. If there is concomitant severe aortic regurgitation or mitral regurgitation, that will underestimate the severity of mitral stenosis. These are the echo images while measuring pressure uptime. It is measured like this. And the formula is mitral valve area is equal to 20 by pressure uptime. And third is area calculation by the continuity equation. The continuity equation based on the principle of conservation of flow. That is what comes in must go out. You should calculate both transmetal stroke volume and trans aortic stroke volume. They should be equal. Uh, mitral, uh, trans, uh, our uh, transmitral uh, stroke volume calculation from the formula is mitral area in the velocity time integral. That should be equal to LVOT area and uh, LVOT velocity time in, uh, uh, velocity time integral. So mitral area will be 0.785 into LVOT uh, square of the LVOT diameter into LVOT VTI divided by the uh, VTI of mitral stenosis Z. So what are the technical consideration uh, while using continuity equation? Intercept angles should be parallel to the mitral stenosis uh, Z and there's uh, will be careful accurate stroke volume calculations, very important. Uh, in case of coexisting MR or AR, is uh, continuity equation is inaccurate. If there is coexisting MR, mitral area will be falsely less. 
that means there will be underestimation of the severity ms if there is coexisting air mitral valve area falsely will be more that will be that means underestimation of the severity of ms in uh, uh, this is 2d co which picture how we measure lvot diameter in plaques view and we trace the border particularly from pulse doppler in uh, lvot we trace the jet, we'll find the velocity time integral in LBOT and uh, this tracing of the mitral stenosis jet, we'll find VTI here. And this is the formula for calculation of mitral area by continuity equation. Now the last is mitral area calculation by the PISA method. Though PISA method is more commonly used for regurgitant lesions, but yes, we can use mitral area calculation by PISA it's based on the principle of conservation of flow and continuity equation. Uh, in physiology, as blood in the left atrium converges towards mitral valve orifice, the blood flow velocity gradually increases and it forms a series of isovelocity -velo -iso hemispheric cells. The flow rate at the surface of hemisphere will be flow rate at stenotic mitral valve orifice, that is according to the continuity equation. The mitral area calculation will be 6.28 into square of the radius of the visa into aliasing velocity into alpha by 180, that is angle correction factor, divided by the peak mitral stenosis jet velocity. Then what are the technical consideration? First, the zoom, the area of mitral valve from the apical four chamber view, use color flow imaging of mitral stenosis jet and shift the zero baseline of color flow map upwards and aliasing velocity should be kept at 30 to 45 centimeter per second. Then freeze color flow image in a cine loop and identify an optimal frame by scrolling back and forth to find an optimal visa and measure its radius in left atrium. Determine the angle between the two mitral leaflets that is alpha at the arterial surface and alpha by 180 degree is called as angle correction factor. Then what are the drawbacks? Drawbacks, PISA method is actually cumbersome and it's not widely used to nowadays. A single color image yields only uh, the volume flow rate at one point time in diastole. Rather, the volume flow rate should be integrated over entire diastole period. That is the drawback of, uh, most important drawback of uh, uh, measuring mitral valve area by PISA. This is how uh, mitral area calculation done by PISA. The, and uh, this is the particular alpha between two layers of mitral valve and the atrial side. And this is how the radius of the pizza is uh, measured. And uh, this is the formula, two pi r square into total velocity, aliasing velocity divided with the mitral stenosis peak velocity into angle correction factor. Then that the indirect measure, uh, that is mitral valve severed by mean transmetal pressure gradient is measured by the continuous of Doppler of mitral stenosis jet. Severe metal stenosis means more than 10 millimeter mercury, moderate means 6 to 10, and mild means more than uh, less than or equal to 5 millimeter mercury. So, so, what is the technical consideration while measuring meaning gradient? Uh, the jet nearly always recorded from apical four chamber view. Careful transducer position and angulation is essential, and intercept angle should be near parallel and should be color flow imaging guided because at times metal stenosis jet may be eccentric. And it depends on transvalvular volume flow rate. In low cardiac output state and bradycardia, gradient may be low. In coexisting mitral regurgitation and immediate post exercise, gradient may be high. Now, coming to uh, uh, hemodynamically significant mitral stenosis, according to 2020 SCC AHA valve disease guidelines, patients with progressive mitral stenosis, that is, mitral valve area more than 1.5 square centimeter but symptomatic, that means patient in class two or class three or class four. Subjects of such patients to supine bicycle exercise or treadmill exercise. With exercise, what happens? Mitral valve area does not change, but cardiac output and heart rate increase. And those contribute to increased transmitter pressure gradient and increase uh, uh, polonic capillary voice pressure and polonic systolic pressure. So what is hemodynamic significant MS? That is defined as if immediate post-exercise mean mitral valve pressure gradient more than 15 millimeter mercury or OS pressure is more than 25 millimeter mercury or PA systolic pressure more than 50 millimeter mercury, they are considered as hemodynamically significant MS can intervene in such cases. So my take home message, the most reliable way to 
determine the severity of mitral stenosis is to calculate the area of mitral valve, not the transmitral pressure gradient. Mitral barrier area can be determined directly by planimetry, continuity equation, and PISA method, indirectly by pressure half time method. Whenever there is ambiguity in mitral valve area measurement in any of the above methods described above, all four methods should be used in that particular case in order to arrive at a conclusion. Exercise hemodynamics should be done whenever there is discordance between clinical symptoms and eco findings in a patient with mitral stenosis, as in your case. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Pooja Vyas. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Kamal Sharma, sir, and his team for giving me this opportunity. Topic given to me is echocardiographic quantification of aortic stenosis. So, scenario given is 80 year old female and being treated with uh, nitrates for angina and whose previous angiogram 10 years back was suggestive of 30% lesion in LAD and now she presented with dyspnea class 2 and angina class 3 and on auscultation there was an ejection systolic murmur with soft S1 and S2 and the junior resident is confused uh, as his outside ECHO report is showing moderate aortic stenosis with fair LV function. So how would I quantify the severity of aortic stenosis using echocardiography? So first of all, let us go through the stages of valvular aortic stenosis. Stage A includes patients who are at risk of aortic stenosis with aortic Gmax, Vmax of less than 2 meter per second. Stage B includes the patients with progressive aortic stenosis, which includes mild aortic stenosis and moderate aortic stenosis. For mild aortic stenosis, Vmax should be between 2 to 2.9 meter per second and the mean pressure gradient should be less than 20 millimeter of mercury. And for moderate aortic stenosis, uh, aortic Vmax should be between 3 to 3.9 meter per second or mean pressure gradient should be between 20 to 39 millimeter of mercury. Now, state C includes asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis patient. Severe aortic stenosis is considered when we get aortic Vmax of more than or equal to 4 meter per second or mean pressure gradient of more than or equal to 40 millimeter of mercury. And at that time, aortic valve area typically is less than or equal to 1 centimeter square. And very severe aortic stenosis is when aortic Vmax we get is more than 5 meter per second or mean pressure gradient is more than 60 millimeter of mercury. Now, stage C2 are the patients who are asymptomatic, uh, severe aortic stenosis patients with LV dysfunction, while stage D includes the symptomatic patients with severe aortic stenosis. So, the severe aortic stenosis here can be of three types. D1 includes those patients with high gradient, high flow aortic stenosis. And D2 includes those symptomatic patients with severe low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis with reduced ejection fraction. And D3 are the patients with paradoxical low flow, severe aortic stenosis, which we will discuss later on. The goals of echocardiographic evaluation for aortic stenosis are to establish the diagnosis of aortic stenosis, to quantify the severity of aortic stenosis and assess the left ventricular function. So, Doppler assessment of the aortic stenosis usually starts with measuring the peak transvalvular velocity and then mean transvalvular gradient and then comes the continuity equation to determine the aortic valve area. So, echo window to be used to me measure these uh, velocities and gradients are apical five chamber view, uh, suprasternal view and the right parasternal view. Multiple views are to be used and we we should take care that Doppler beam should be aligned with the direction of the stenotic jet to get the perfect aortic velocities. Simplified Bernoulli equation is uh, used to estimate the peak uh, gradient. And uh, this uh, equation is a, a proven practical and non-invasive method for determining the pressure gradient across the aortic valve. And it correlates very well with the invasive uh, pressures and gradients. So from the Doppler recording, by using the equation uh, P equal to 4V square, here the velocity is taken in meter per second and we can get the maximum 
pressure gradient across the stenotic one. And to get the mean pressure gra gradient, another equation is there. Uh, so the mean pressure gradient equal to the maximum pressure gradient upon 1.45 plus two millimeter of mercury. Usually this is uh, calculated by the software. It utilizes the data of the instantaneous uh, uh, velocities across the aortic valve and it provides the value. So usually it is software generated. So here the color wave Doppler is put across the aortic valve in the five chamber aortic, uh, five chamber apical view. And what we get is the uh, aortic uh, velocity jet. And by dressing this uh, aortic jet, we get that maximum velocity is 2.6 meter per second. So it suggests that it is mild aortic stenosis. And aortic stenosis should be quantified not only in one view, it should be quantified from the multiple views. See here in the figure one, the aortic velocities were taken from the apical uh, phi chamber view and it showed the velocity of 3.9 meter per second, while the right parasternal view showed the velocity of 4.8 meter per second. So if the peak gradient would have been under, the peak gradient would have been underestimated if the echocardiographer had concluded the examination with the apical uh, views rather than moving to the right parasternal uh, window where the higher velocity was recorded. Limitations of pressure gradient calculations, uh, we should know that uh, these uh, valve gradients are dynamic. And so it varies with heart rate, loading condition of the heart, blood pressure, and the inotropic state of the heart. So if there is malalignment of the uh, jet and the ultrasound beam, it will lead to the underestimation of the pressure gradients. So any underestimation of the aortic velocity, it will result in the greater underestimation of the gradient because the uh, pressure gradient is pressure gradient is equal to four by V square. And there is also one limitation that due to the similar uh, similarity in the location of the mitral regurgitant jet and the similarity of the location of the aortic stenosis uh, jet and the direction of the jet, we may get confused with the MR jet. And in the aortic regurgitation, usually the stroke volume is higher. So the flow across the valve during the systole will be higher and it will lead to the overestimation of the aortic stenosis if there is coexistent aortic regurgitation. And in LV dysfunction, opposite will occur due to reduction in the stroke volume. There will be false underestimation of the pressure gradient. So it will lead to the underestimation of the aortic stenosis. Here, see, due to the similarity in the location and the direction of the flow of the aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation, uh, there may be a confusion between AS and MR. So how to resolve that? See here, the vertical line, it provides a representative line in, in relation to the QRS complex. So there will be the gap between a vertical line and onset of the flow in aortic stenosis, while the mitral regurgitation, it starts with the uh, isovolumetric contraction phase and it continues through the isovolumetric relaxation phase. So the duration will be more in case of mitral regurgitation. So complete evaluation of the quantification of the aortic stenosis includes aortic valve, uh, determination of aortic valve area using the continuity equation. And this continuity equation is based on the principle of uh, conservation of mass. And the continuity equation states that the stroke volume proximal to the aortic valve must equal the stroke volume through the stenotic orifice. And because the stroke volume is the product of the cross-sectional area and the time velocity integral, the continuity equation can be arranged this way that aortic valve area equal to cross-sectional area of the LVOT into a time velocity integral of the LVOT upon time velocity integral of the aortic stenosis. So to calculate the aortic 
wall area, we need three measurements. One is the cross-sectional area of the LVOT. Second is the time velocity uh, integral of LVOT and TVI of the aortic stenosis. To calculate the cross-sectional area, we need uh, uh, the cross-sectional area is calculated by this formula pi r square and the diameter of the LVOT should be taken in the flex view while the time velocity integral is to be taken in phi chamber apical view just proximal to the aortic wall by putting the pulse wave Doppler image. So it gives the time velocity integral of the LVOT. And by putting the continuous wave Doppler, we can get the aortic stenotic jet. And by this, uh, by tracing this aortic stenosis, uh, stenosis jet, we can get the TBI of the aortic stenosis. So this is an example where the uh, diameter of the LVOT is two centimeters. So radius is one centimeter. And uh, by that, the cross-sectional area is 3.14 centimeters square. TVI of the LVOT is 11 centimeter. TVI of the aortic stenosis is 59 centimeter. And by putting these values and this formula, we'll get the aortic wall area of 0.6 centimeters square. And there is even a simplified version of this uh, continuity equation where this uh, a v, a TVI has been replaced with the maximum uh, velocity across the LVOT and maximum velocity across the uh, aortic wall. Considering that the flow duration across these uh, two places is the same. So we can even uh, calculate aortic wall area using this formula. And the continuity equation has uh, two important advantages as compared to Bernoulli's equation. Uh, one is if there is coexistent uh, aortic regurgitation, Bernoulli's equation will overestimate the aortic stenosis, while uh, continuity equation will not have uh, that effect on it. And similarly, uh, with LV dysfunction, there will be decrease reduction in the stroke volume. And so the uh, Bernoulli's equation will show the underestimation of the aortic stenosis. Well, that will not occur with the, uh, this continuity equation. So there are some limitations of continuity equations too. So there is intra and inter-observer variability. So variability is no noted uh, around three to four percentage while measuring aortic stenotic jet and LVOT velocity and somewhat higher for measuring the LVOT diameter, it is around 5 to 8 percentage. And when we have subaortic flow velocities abnormal, then uh, stroke volume calculation at this site is not accurate. And other potential factors that can contribute to errors are image quality, annular uh, calcification, uh, non-circular uh, annulus, and failure to measure the true diameter. So it is very important to measure the accurate LVOT diameter it is because when we calculate uh, the aortic wall area the cross sectional area is pi r square so if there is a, even a small error so it will be reflected highly in the final equation because the uh, it is uh, in the equation the radius is squared so the smaller error can lead to the uh, big error finally so we must take care while calculating the LVOT diameter. So according to SEC AHA uh, guidelines, uh, we can say um, uh, we will uh, differentiate the aortic stenosis into mild, moderate, severe, and uh, very severe category. So mild aortic stenosis is when aortic wall area is between 1.5 to 2 centimeters square and mean gradient is less than 20 millimeter of mercury and jet velocity is 2 to 2.9 meter per second. Moderate aortic stenosis is when the wall area is 1 to 1.5 centimeters square. Mean gradient is between 20 to 39 millimeter of mercury and jet velocity is between 3 to 3.9. We will say that aortic stenosis is severe when aortic wall area is less than one centimeter square and mean gradient is more than or equal to 40 millimeter of mercury and jet velocity is more than or equal to four meter per second. 
and very severe AS with wall area of less than one centimeter square, but the gradient here is even higher, more than 60 millimeter of mercury and velocity is, peak velocity is more than or equal to five meter per second. So severe AS can be of three types. It can be either high flow, high gradient, normal LV uh, with normal uh, LV ejection fraction, it can be of low flow, low gradient with low LV ejection fraction and low flow, low gradient with preserved ejection fraction, which is paradoxically low flow, severe aortic stenosis. So here comes the role of dobutamine stress echo. So whenever there is LV dysfunction with severe aortic stenosis, it can be there can be two diagnostic possibilities. Either it can be true anatomically severe aortic stenosis or it can be pseudo severe aortic stenosis by saying pseudo severe aortic stenosis we mean to say that it is not severe but it looks like severe aortic stenosis so it is just mild to moderate aortic stenosis with where the valve leaflets are not opening fully and it gives uh, it looks like severe aortic stenosis because the stroke volume is low so dobutamine increases the stroke volume it allows the differentiation between these two possibilities just we discussed and um, we assume that the, and the test assumes that the leaflets if the leaflets are relatively flexible the valve area will increase in response to the increase in the stroke volume and if there is true severe aortic stenosis which is a fixed uh, which has a fixed valve area so the valve area will not change with the dobutamine infusion so if there is pseudo severe aortic stenosis valve area will increase the dose used for dobutamine stress echo is we should start from uh, 5 microgram per kg per minute in a 5 microgram incremental value uh, every 5 minutes up to maximum of the 30 microgram per kg per minute or until the LVOT velocity or VTI reaches the normal value like if uh, until the uh, LVOT velocities are between 0.8 to 1.2 meter per second or uh, VTI, uh, VTI between 20 to 25 centimeter. So, in case of true aortic stenosis with dobutamine stress echo, there will be increase in the peak velocity and VTI of both LVOT as well as aortic valve. So the ratio of VTI, LVOT VTI to aortic velocity VTI, it will remain constant. But and the aortic valve area by continuity equation will be less than or equal to one centimeter square. But in case of pseudo severe aortic uh, stenosis due to the dobutamine there will be higher stroke volume it will lead to the increase in the excursion of the aortic leaflets and it will lead to the increase in the aortic valve area so with the dobutamine infusion there will be increase in the aortic valve area there will be increase in the lvot vti which is far greater than that of the aortic valve vti so the ratio of lvot vti to aortic valve vti will increase so if there is increase in the aortic valve area with the infusion of the dobutamine to more than 1.2 centimeter square, it is confirmatory that this patient has pseudo severe aortic stenosis. So this uh, image shows that uh, first image shows uh, this is dobutamine stress echo and severe aortic stenosis with normal function, which has high uh, gradients, severe aortic stenosis with uh, low gradients, and uh, with the infusion of doba, uh, dobutamine, so there will be this, uh, the ratio will remain constant. LVOT to aortic valve VTI ratio is constant, 0.2. Well, in case of the pseudo severe aortic stenosis, the ratio increased. And the, see here, the ratio is now, uh, it has increased from 0.2 to 0.3. So as we are discussing, uh, Dobutamine stress echo, we must uh, discuss uh, contractile reserve also. So uh, by definition, contractile reserve is increase in the stroke volume of more than 20% with dobutamine. And it is measured as 20% increase in the LVOT VTI by pulse wave Doppler. So failure, to, failure of ventricle to augment with dobutamine, it predicts a poor outcome 
with aortic wall velocity and the perioperative mortality will be as high as 50 percentage if there is no contractile reserve. So response to dobutamine stress echo can be with uh, true severe AS, AV gradient will increase, stroke volume will increase, and aortic wall area will not change with true severe AS. But if there is pseudo severe aortic stenosis, means there is it is functional aortic stenosis with mild to moderate aortic stenosis, aortic wall gradient will increase, stroke volume will increase. But with that, aortic wall area will also increase. And usually it increases to more than 1.2 centimeters square. And where there is no contractile reserve, there will be no change in AV gradient, stroke volume, or aortic wall area with dobutamine infusion. Uh, now, paradoxical low flow severe AS. So, to define paradoxical low flow severe AS, patient must have LV ejection fraction of more than 50 percent. And uh, aortic wall area by continuity equation should be less than or equal to one centimeter square. Aortic Vmax by Bernoulli's equation should be less than or equal to four meter per second. And this pressure gradient should be less than 40 millimeter of uh, mercury. And the stroke volume index should be less than 35 ml per meter square and measure when the patient is normotensive with blood pressure, systolic blood pressure of less than 140 millimeter of mercury. Here, what happens with severe AS, there will be concentric LVH and it will lead to smaller ventricular cavity and this LVH will lead to the reduced LV compliance. So ultimately, this all things together will lead to reduced stroke volume. And so low stroke volume will give us paradoxical low flow severe aortic stenosis. So, and this is all uh, we discussed uh, about the echocardiographic quantification of uh, aortic uh, stenosis. Thank you very much. Paul. So, a very good morning to all my senior colleagues and juniors. Uh, today, we'll be discussing about a case of fever in patient who has undergone mitral wall replacement. So let's see our patient. So our patient is a 66 year old Indian female. She had undergone mitral wall replacement six years back. She was doing well post surgery, uh, well anticoagulated, and her time in therapeutic range was more than 70%. She presented to us with low grade fever, uh, which was present for 10 days. Outside, a cardiophysician saw some doubtful small structure which was attached to the leaflet of mitral wall process. What is it? What is our patient suffering from? What is the cause of pyrexia in this patient? And for that matter, any patient who presents with pyrexia of a longer duration. The most common causes in immunocompetent individuals include infective endocarditis, discitis, osteomyelitis, occult abscesses, and infection of any implanted device. Our patient has a clue in the form of a doubtful structure which is attached on the leaflet of her mitral wall processes on duty echo. So is it prosthetic wall infection? Well, it would be too early to say so. Yes, the most common presenting symptom in patients with prosthetic wall endocarditis is fever. You should always keep a high index of suspicion in patients who have undergone mitral or aortic wall replacement because prosthetic, the symptoms of prosthetic wall endocarditis include fever and other constitutional symptoms like fatigue, poor appetite, and weakness. And these symptoms are also present during other infection. Late onset prosthetic wall endocarditis can be defined as endocarditis occurring more than one year following wall replacement surgery. All the staph, aureus, and cons remain important causes. The microbiology of these late onset infections resemble more closely that of native wall endocarditis. So is our diagnosis clear? Wait a minute. The most commonly encountered and frustrating clinical situation is the administration of empirical antibiotics without first obtaining blood cultures when patients with prosthetic hal fall present to clinicians in outpatient or emergency with fever. So yes, there is a doubt that our patient too have, must have received some sort of antibiotic before she presented to us. But yes, we have echo and specially T to our rescue. Transesophageal echo, better known as TEE, enables better visualization of cardiac structures 
especially the apical side of mitral valve perspective compared to the transthoracic echo. T is especially useful in assessing the perivalvular extension of the infection and detection of vegetations on prosthetic heart valve and cardiovascular implantable electronic devices. Transesophageal echo has better diagnostic yield not only for native valve endocarditis but also for prosthetic mitral valve endocarditis, prosthetic mitral valve abscesses, and perivalvular mitral regurgitation due to the infection of the mitral valve perspective. Based on these data, T has now become the imaging test of choice in all the patients who are suspected to have endogaritis involving the prosthetic heart ball. So what is the role of T in our patient? How does T help the diagnosis in our patient? We'll just go through the Duke criteria. The Duke criteria has been set uh, for diagnosing patients who have endogaritis involving not only the native ball, but also the prosthetic ball. It has two major criteria in the terms, in the form of typical blood culture and imaging evidence of valvular involvement by infection and minor criteria, which include a predisposing heart condition, fever, vascular phenomena, immunologic phenomena, and atypical culture or virology. Thanks to T, if we don't do T in our patient, would be very clear what that small structure attached to mitral valve processes would be, which would mostly would be a vegetation as against thrombus or panis, considering the history she has. So ultimately, we would be reaching to our diagnosis using the T and the Duke criteria. So our patient would have either two major in the form of an imaging evidence of some sort of infection attached to mitral valve leaflet and a typical blood culture. If the patient would have been given antibiotics outside, we would have either one major and three minor criteria, major in the form of imaging evidence and minor, form, minor in the form of fever, a predisposing heart condition, and atypical theology or culture, thus confirming the diagnosis of our patient to be having prosthetic valve endocarditis, and ultimately we can start the treatment. Just to summarize, transesophageal echo is necessary in all cases suspected to have prosthetic valve endocarditis for not only diagnosing, but for valvular hemodynamic assessment and eventual detection of vegetations attached to the valve, abscesses, or fistula. It is useful in estimating the mobility of the leaflet and the stability of the valvular ring. Detection of vegetations may be difficult due to artifacts from the valves while doing transthoracic echo, and hence transthoracic echo lost its sheen. But the sensitivity of transesophageal echo or T in the detection of prosthetic valve endocarditis is as high as 82 to 96%. At the same time, the negative predictive value of transesophageal echo in patients with suspected prosthetic valve endocarditis ranges from 86 to 94 percent. And hence, T in not only in our patient, but in any patient whom all my colleagues or juniors face having prosthetic valve along with fever after having excluded other common causes of fever would be really helpful in diagnosing patients with prosthetic valve endocarditis. Thank you all for your patient hearing. Thank you so much. Yeah, so, uh, hello everyone. So today I'll be uh, discussing about a case scenario, which is a 32-year-old male who has presented uh, to us with uh, dyspnea, ascites, and pedal edema for two months. And his echo was suggestive of a restrictive physiology. So, he has a past history of pulmonary tuberculosis for which he was treated two years back. Now, how would a cardiac catheterization would help us arriving at the diagnosis. That's what we are going to discuss today in our discussion. So based on the findings and the eco finding of restrictive physiology, what we'll have is in our minds is a constrictive pericarditis, pericarditis versus a restrictive cardiomyopathy. And since he's having a past history of tuberculosis, we'll always think of a constrictive pericarditis also in our case. Why is it important to differentiate between them? Because constrictive pericarditis is a, has a potentially reversible cause. It can be treated surgically, whereas restrictive cardiomyopathy has very limited therapeutic options. Now, both of them, they result in impaired ventricular feeling. And they both present with a similar kind of clinical manifestations, predominantly right heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So both of them can give rise to clinical features which were there in our case, 
that is dyspnea with ascites pedal edema the both can present in this way so before starting directly on to cardiac catheterization findings uh, we'll first discuss what are the normal cardiac hemodynamics to understand better cardiac findings catheterization findings in our case so we'll discuss shortly about uh, normal cardiac hemodynamics so the diastolic filling is what we are going to discuss today diastolic filling depends upon two factors mainly ones which are extrinsic to cardiac chamber and the intrinsic myocardial properties the extrinsic to cardiac chambers are the loading conditions which are imposed upon the heart the pericardial restraint the chest geometry and the intrinsic myocardial properties include the myocardial stiffness and the viscoelastic forces so ventricular diastole it's a complex sequence of interrelated events and it is divided into basically three components a phase of early rapid filling where you have ventricular relaxation there is a driving pressure gradient across the mitral valve forcing the blood from la to lv there is a pericardial restraint and myocardial stiffness now why i have focused on pericardial restraint is this in initial phase the pericardial restraint is minimal so in constrictive pericarditis the initial rapid filling will be a steep one then there is another phase where there is late diastolic filling where there is a continuous ventricular relaxation there is pericardial restraint and interventricular interactions are acting at this phase and the final phase is atrial contraction a diastolic dysfunction is the hallmark of both elevated ventricular fillings and mean elevated atrial pressures are found in both of them in constrictive pericarditis the early rapid phase is preserved because the pericardial constraint it starts just after the early rapid filling has started and in restrictive cardiomyopathy there is a pan diastolic impairment so this is a nice uh, diagram to show the diastolic uh, uh, through the diastolic diastology you can say the diastolic uh, phases of uh, filling of the ventricle first there is an interventricular relaxation time where there is no filling and the ventricles are relaxed and the phase of rapid filling where there is a pressure gradient between la and lv and that drives the early rapid phase and then there is a phase of diastasis and equalization of pressure and the final phase of atrial contraction and the final phase of filling in diastole now how does respiratory uh, variation effect on this hemodynamics so pericardium it encompasses both the ventricles ra and most of la and we all know svc and ivc are not intrathoracic so they are largely unaffected by these swings in the intrathoracic pressure now what happens is during inspiration there is a drop in the intrathoracic pressure which is transmitted to the cardiac chambers and pulmonary veins but there is no given change in systemic venous pressure so there is a gradient in the right heart filling so this will cause an increase right heart filling in inspiration and this pulmonary veins are in, entirely intrathoracic and therefore the pressure which is reduced in the cardiac chambers is also uniformly decreased within the pulmonary veins so the left sided filling does not significantly alter during inspiration or expiration however during expiration the right heart filling decreases relative to inspiration and therefore the left heart filling remains relatively constant so what will happen in constrictive physiology or constrictive cardiomyopathy the primary uh, hemodynamic consequence is limitation of blood flow blood volume that can be accommodated by the heart during diastole there is equalization of right and left sided cardiac filling pressures what happens is because of the rigid pericardium it isolates the cardiac chamber from intra thoracic pressure swings which were earlier transmitted to the cardiac chambers now they are unable to transmit so this causes an under transmission of uh, under transmission of reduced intra thoracic pressures to the cardiac chambers during inspiration now inspiratory reduction in the pulmonary capillary and venous pressure reduces the flow between the pulmonary veins and the left sided cardiac chambers this rigid pericardium with the relatively fixed intra 
pericardial volume reduces the lv filling allowing for an increased rv filling uh, this is accompanied by an inspiratory intraventricular septal motion towards the lv which we can see as a septal bounce if we have done the echo and the reverse is seen in expiration so with expiration there is rise in intrathoracic pressures and this augments the flow in left heart the increased left heart filling with the fixed total intrapericardial volume which is found in constrictive pericarditis is pushes the interventricular septum towards right and thus reducing rv filling and creating an expiratory diastolic flow reversal which is again transmitted back into the ivc and the hepatic veins so you will find an expiratory flow reversal in hepatic veins and ivc in constrictive pericarditis so this is a schematic diagram which shows uh, the changes with respiratory variation uh, there is uh, with the inspiration there is an increased filling in the right sided and the septum is shifted towards the left side and in expiration the increased filling occurs in the left side and thus the septum shift towards opposite side and this is also recorded as an reversed uh, flow reversal in hepatic veins so if you see uh if i summarize it there's a inelas inelastic and thickened pericardium with the reduced compliance it results in a fixed pericardial volume and a mid diastolic restraint it fails to accumulate the increase in venous return and the ventricles accommodate the increased venous return by the shift of ivs towards the other ventricle then there is dissociation of thoracic and cardiac pressures in inspiration the pcwp is reduced and the lv diastolic pressure is not reduced causes causing a reduced lv filling during inspiration and this results in an exaggerated ventricular interdependence and ventricular discordance again further discussing the accentuated early rapid filling as i already mentioned the early rapid filling is accentuated in constrictive pericarditis it occurs because there is high driving force and unimpeded early ventricular relaxation the ventricles are free to relax in the early phase in constrictive pericarditis and this is followed by a sudden rapid rise in pressure by the by the further pericardial restraint now this results in a rapid y descent and a square root sign on ventricular pressure which will further see again in constrictive pericarditis there is preserved atrial relaxation as well as an exaggerated ventricular longitudinal contraction which is preserved because the muscle ventricular muscle is preserved as a result of which there is an exaggerated x descent on the atrial pressure tracings so this is a diagram which nicely shows you that there is a exact y prominent y descent as well as a exaggerated or prominent x descent which is found in constrictive pericarditis that's because there is an early rapid filling and preserved ventricular contraction and this is another sign that is dip and plateau sign or square root sign where there is a early rapid filling and a dip uh, early dip and a sharp dip which is observed in constrictive pericarditis the left vent, uh, uh, the dip more than 7 mm is characteristically seen in constrictive pericarditis and usually this early rapid filling is also observed in restrictive cardiomyopathy but more than 7 mm of mercury suggest more in favor of constrictive pericarditis again as i i have already mentioned during inspiration the rv pressures are high and the lv pressures reduces because there is ventricular discordance in constrictive pericarditis and in expiration the lv pressure rises and the rv pressures goes down now this is known as ventricular discordance so from here what we what there is a systolic area index which is measured by area calculating the area of rv versus upon lv area in inspiration divided by rv area by lv area in expiration so you expect this uh, to be more than one at least uh, to be found in constrictive pericarditis so more than 1.1 the index is significantly higher in constrictive pericarditis compared to restrictive cardiomyopathy a ratio of more than 1.1 is sensitive 
to the point of 97% and is accurate up to almost specificity of 100% to identify constrictive pericarditis. So it's very important to, while doing cardiac catheterization to measure simultaneous uh, pressure gradients of LV and RV and uh, inspiratory and expiratory uh, recordings and calculate the area and measure the systolic area index. Now, what happens in restrictive cardiomyopathy? See this, unless complex, unlike the complex interplay of pulmonary and systemic pressures which are associated with constrictive pericarditis, restrictive cardiomyopathy is something which is intrinsic to the myocardium and they are not changed with respiration. And as with constrictive pericarditis, there is early rapid filling in early diastole because of the high atrial pressures, but it is followed by limitation in filling from the stiff myocardium. And this results in a prominent Y descent on atrial pressure curves as well as the square root sign. And the stiff non-compliant ventricles are unable to easily accept the additional increment on volume during atrial contraction and thus the contribution from atrial contraction is very minimal. So here you can see the tracing. There is a prominent Y descent, but the X descent is blunted because the ventricular longitudinal contraction here is blunted because the my myocardium is involved. Also, the atrial muscle uh, are also may be involved in re restrictive cardiomyopathy and hence the X descent is blunted. Now, this is a, one of the chief difference between the two. As I have told, the X descent is blunted given because the poor atrial relaxation and increased venous flow in inspiration is unable to be accommodated by a non-compliant RV. And there is a, hence, there is a diastolic flow reversal in hepatic vein with inspiration. So what we have seen, a diastolic flow reversal with expiration in constrictive pericarditis with inspiration, it occurs in restrictive cardiomyopathy. And there is no discordance in intracravitary and intrathoracic pressures in constrictive cardiomyopathy. So here you can see the discordance, which was very apparent in constrictive pericarditis is not seen in restrictive cardiomyopathy. So while doing catheterization, uh, it, both disease, it does demonstrate a rapid early diastolic filling with elevated and equalization of end diastolic pressures. Now, although there is a presence of pulmonary hypertension, which usually favors restrictive cardiomyopathy, almost a third of patients with constrictive pericarditis will also have pulmonary hypertension. And after brisk early filling, ventricular pressure rises rapidly as pericardial constraining volume is reached. And this result in the square root or a deep end plateau sign. This can be seen in both. I have already mentioned in constrictive pericarditis as well as restrictive cardiomyopathy, but the LV rapid filling wave, which we have seen with the height of more than 7 mm, it favors constrictive pericarditis. A Kusumol sign, which is uh, correct, quantified as less than 5 mm decrease in the inspiratory RA pressure is present in both, but the disproportionate abnormalities of diastolic dysfunction, it results in the ratio of RVDP to RVSP of greater than 1 is to 3 in constrictive pericarditis. Equalization of diastolic pressures results from the fixed pericardial volume and increased interventricular dependence. So this equalization of pressure that is less than uh, three, almost less than three will be finding in constrictive pericarditis while uh, LVDP will be more than RVDP in restrictive cardiomyopathy by more than four or five mm of Hg. So if you see this uh, meta-analysis where they had uh, seen the uh, difference uh, uh, between the, these two parameters where as I already mentioned, uh, LVDP minus RVDP greater than or equal to four will suggest more of restrictive cardiomyopathy, but it's not that uh, constrictive pericarditis patients won't be having or will always be having this or the other criteria. Again, RVDP by RV systolic pressure of uh, greater than one third will be having more in patients with uh, constrictive pericarditis than restrictive cardiomyopathy, but it's not a dictum. And you have to correlate everything when you are assessing the patient. So to summarize, in constrictive pericarditis, there is a prominent Y descent, which is present in both, but the X descent is present in constrictive pericarditis, whereas in, it's blunted in restrictive cardiomyopathy. Equalization of the pressures are more 
commonly found in constrictive pericarditis, whereas the LVDP is slightly raised than RVDP by 5 mm in restrictive cardiomyopathy. The square root sign is definitely seen in both, but it's more exaggerated and more uh, the right ventricular filling wave of greater than 7 mm is found in constrictive pericarditis. The filling pressures of greater than 25 are common in restrictive cardiomyopathy, and hence the pulmonary artery systolic pressure is also higher in restrictive cardiomyopathy. LVDP by RV systolic pressure is more than one third. It suggests constrictive pericarditis. LV by RV interdependence, and probably this is the most important sign which we have to elicitate in during hemodynamics of uh, restrictive physiology. The LV RV interdependence, it's discordant in constrictive pericarditis and concordance in restrictive cardiomyopathy. Now, this is again a chart which shows uh, some of the Doppler findings where there is a respiratory variation uh, in the mitral inflow velocity, which is found in constrictive pericarditis. Then the ventricular wall thickness will be increased in restrictive cardiomyopathy. The pericardial thickness may be found increased in constrictive pericarditis. The atrial size, the classical biatrial enlargement is seen in restrictive cardiomyopathy. The septal bounds, as we have discussed, is present in constrictive pericarditis. The most, probably the most important sign in ECHO is the Doppler E prime velocity, which is uh, in the medial E dash is more than nine is more suggestive of uh, constrictive uh, pericarditis rather than restrictive cardiomyopathy because this is the sign of uh, 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 the myocardial uh, muscle uh, uh, involvement or not. So the restrictive cardiomyopathy, generally the E prime velocities are on the lower side. And the systolic area index uh, is probably the most specific sign to differentiate the two. But there are some caveats, like uh, if, you, uh, if you are not finding uh, uh, hemodynamics, then uh, may effusive constrictive pericarditis pattern. Uh, ob obviously, atrial fibrillation uh, will interfere with our assessment. And an AV groove constriction uh, can cause a disproportionate rise in LA pressure and PCWP. So you have to uh, look for this caveat and many a times you have to give a fluid challenge if the patient is grossly hypovolemic also before doing uh, cardiac catheterization. Thank you. So myself, Dr. Ashish Mishra, uh, currently working as assistant professor in the Department of Cardiology at UN Metha Hospital. So today, in fact, uh, we are going to discuss an echocardiographic assessment of uh, uh, diastolic function with a case-based approach. So we have a case, 66-year uh, female, diabetic hypertensive, symptomatic with class 2 dyspnea. And on initial evaluation, she has normal ECG and normal troponin levels. Also that she has elevated anti-proBNP level and this warrants further assessment. We should keep following conditions uh, in mind, seeing the clinical picture of our case. So conditions which are associated with diastolic dysfunction, which are hypertension, ischemic heart disease, primary myocardial disease in the form of dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy, and also pericardial pathologies like constrictive pericarditis and cardiac temporal. Conditions that mimic diastolic dysfunction are pulmonary disease, deconditioning, anemia, thyroid illness, valvular heart disease, and congenital heart disease. So echocardiographic assessment in our case will particularly encompass the following variables, particularly chamber morphology, LV systolic and diastolic function, RV function, valvular pathology, great vessel assessment, assessment for pulmonary veins and vena cavae and pericardium. So this in fact is a comprehensive echocardiographic assessment and we will particularly focus on the parameters to for LV function, particularly LV diastolic function in our case. As we know, diastolic uh, dysfunction carries prognosis as bad as LV systolic dysfunction. And these are the typical phases of uh, diastole which starts with isovolumetric relaxation, then rapid early passive LV filling, then diastasis, and then the atrial contraction, which contributes to the late LV filling. Also, we should know that there are various factors which are influencing the diastolic function of heart. 
these are typically preload lv compliance heart rate then the active myocardial relaxation lv geometry lv dyssynchrony lv filling pressure also the interaction with pericardium and the la pulmonary veins and the mitral valve pathologies so since lv diastolic function is uh, influenced by so many parameters also we should do an integrated echo assessment which will encompass various parameters for assessment of lv diastolic function these are left atrium volume index then the assessment of mitral inflow velocities and pulmonary venous flow with pw then assessment of early and late uh, mitral annular velocities and also that we should assess the flow velocity propagation which is vp by color flow m mode and assessment of tricuspid regurgitation z none of this parameter should be used in isolation for assessment of lv diastolic function so now we start with the first variable which is the uh, left atrial volume index and it starts with the assessment of uh, assessment in four chamber and two chamber views and where we can see that uh, this measurements are taken at end diastole and systole just prior to the opening of mitral valve in four chamber and two chamber views by excluding the pulmonary veins and measuring the lv volume uh, should be corrected to the body mass index an isolated increase in left atrial size is the morphologic expression of chronic diastolic dysfunction it also reflects both duration and severity of disease so this is a typical assessment for lavi with the area length method and also by prolate ellipse method now the assessment for ivrt which is the isovolumetric relaxation time so the duration of relaxation prior to uh, mitral valve opening is important and when this relaxation is prolonged my, uh, mitral valve opening is delayed and ivrt is increased and conversely again when left atrial pressure is elevated mitral valve opening will occur earlier and ivrt will be shortened so typically this is the time frame between the ejection phase and the initiation of e wave so the time interval between the e ejection time and the initiation of e wave velocity at mitral inflow is the ivrt so it is derived using the pulse wave doppler with uh, uh, obtaining a modified apical four chamber view sample volume is placed midway between the inflow and outflow areas so that the mitral and aortic flows are captured simultaneously at least three measurements of ivrt should be obtained and averaged now in fact we move on to the uh, assessment for mitral inflow velocities and deacceleration time so this is again the typical mitral inflow signal where we can see the e wave a wave the, sometimes we can have a intermediate mid diastolic uh, uh, wave which is called as the l wave and then we have the deacceleration time which starts from the peak of e wave to the baseline so this is again depicted in the photographic uh, cartoon representation over the diagram so the technical pulse for mitral inflow velocity is basically it again starts with a, 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 a starts with a apical four chamber view with color flow imaging for optimal alignment pw a doppler sample volume typically 1 to 3 mm between the mitral leaflet tips e wave velocity is basically the peak velocity in early diastole and if with the ecg getting it corresponds just after the t wave and a velocity is the peak velocity in late diastole which again corresponds just after the p wave has ended so this is the typical uh, 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 vol uh, sample volume uh, which uh, which has been attained within 1 to 3 mm of the mitral uh, inflow area and we can see the e waves a wave also the deacceleration time from the peak of e wave to the baseline so this variables are uh, well depicted in this diagram so we should know also the variables which affect the peak e and a velocity so peak e velocity depends upon the la lv pressure gradient on early uh, diastole la pressure and the lv compliance and typically peak e velocity is uh, more than the peak a velocity in normal subjects peak a velocity depends upon the lv compliance and la contractile function so based on the, the e and a velocity and the e by a ratio we can in fact uh, grade the uh, we can assess the diastolic function and also grade lv diastolic dysfunction uh, this is a typical uh, algorithm as per the american society of echocardiography and this we will be discussing in detail uh, right at the end of our uh, this assessment of various variables so if e by a ratio is less than 0.8 with e velocity 
less than 50 centimeters per second it denotes grade 1 diastolic uh, dysfunction e, e, by a ratio more than 2 it depicts grade 3 diastolic dysfunction and intermediate values between 0.8 to 2 with e, ve e velocity more than 50 will need further assessment with other variables so this is the typical L wave which we were talking. Uh, uh, it is an interposed wave between the peak A velo E velocity and the A velocity, and it is also sometimes called as the mid-diastolic mitral flow wave. So it again depicts the presence of uh, the abnormal presence of L wave. Again, depicts goes on through depicts delayed relaxation and increased filling pressure. So these are the typical. Uh, this is a cartoon uh, uh, depicting the typical E and A velocity and it and the correlation and how it is utilized in assessing the LV diastolic pattern. So here we can see basically the E, uh, more E and A ratio and the ratio being in fact in the normal range. Then we have the grade one uh, where we have, we can see the impaired relaxation phase where A is uh, more than the E wave in pseudo normal pattern or with the grade two pattern where we can see that the E and A is same as the normal, but we have to take help of the Valsalva maneuver and bring about the impaired relaxation phase. So grade two uh, pattern will reverse it to grade one pattern if there if uh, with Valsalva maneuver and again we have reversible uh, restrictive phase which is grade three and irreversible re restrictive phase which are again separated based on the Valsalva maneuver so thus the both the patterns of E and A waves and the mitral deacceleration time follow a biphasic course as diastolic function worsens this limits the usefulness of mitral inflow velocities alone in assessment of LV diastolic dysfunction. So this is the application of Valsalva maneuver in assessing the diastolic dysfunction. So in normal subjects reduction uh, with Valsalva maneuver, reduction in velocity affects both E and A waves to a similar degree. And so that the e, a, e by A ratio is almost un unchanged. But in pseudo, uh, pseudo normal stage, which is grade two diastolic dysfunction, the Valsalva maneuver will change the pattern to one resembling the impaired uh, relaxation pattern by particularly bringing about lowering of the preload and delayed relaxation pattern is typically unmasked with this maneuver. During the Valsalva strain phase, a decrease in EY ratio of more than 50% is again a useful indicator of elevated filling pressures. So the factors that affect the mitral inflow pattern should also be taken into consideration. These are particularly extremes of heart rate, particularly extremes of sinus tachycardia, first degree atrioventricular block, atrial fibrillation, and mitral valve disease in the form of mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, now the another variable which we should be looked after is the deacceleration time, which is the defined as the time integral uh, time interval from the early peak inflow velocity of particularly E wave to the cessation of the rapid early filling phase. So this is the typical deacceleration time from the peak of E wave to the baseline, and it typically is normal uh, limits are between 140 to 240 milliseconds, and it is inversely proportional to the chamber stiffness. Now we move on to the mitral annular velocity, which is assessed by the tissue uh, Doppler imaging. So basically, impaired LV relaxation lowers the E dash velocity. Best non-load dependent measure of LV uh, relaxation phase is reflected by the E dash uh, parameter. Abnormal values are particularly septal E dash. Basically, septal E dash is measured by putting the pulse wave Doppler right at the septal uh, annular uh, uh, location of the annular uh, uh, level. And septal E dash less than seven centimeters per second or lateral E dash less than 10 centimeters per second would reflect abnormal diastolic dysfunction. Uh, dysfunction. And in fact, E by E dash ratio, which again re reflects the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or the LV indirect LV filling pressure uh, with a ratio more than 14 would go on to uh, suggest that the presence of LV diastolic dysfunction. So, in fact, how we get this uh, e, uh, e by E dash ratio or the E dash velocity. So, basically, we, are, we start with the four chamber view. The sample volume is positioned on the mitral valve annulus just near the insertion point of the mitral valve. E dash should be measured at both septal and lateral locations. Sweep should, uh, should be set between 50 to 100 centimeters per second and it should be average uh, for at least three consecutive cycles. So uh, this is a typical uh, E dash and A dash, uh, A dash velocities. And in fact, we should al always derive after the, after getting the E dash values, E by E dash ratio, which goes on to reflect the E by, uh, which goes on to reflect the LV uh, filling pressures. So normal E by E dash ratio is less than 10. 
and peak annular velocities in early diastole which is reflected by e dash primarily depends on the lv relaxation when diastolic function is abnormal e dash is relatively independent of preload however when diastolic function is normal e dash increases with higher filling pressure so in fact e by e dash ratio predicts filling pressure in the setting of abnormal diastolic function some of the limitation which are associated with the assessment uh, with this assessment technique is e and e dash are obtained from different cardiac cycles and at different times age preload and systolic function can also affect these parameters also that regional wall motion abnormality prosthetic mitral valves annular rings and significant annular calcification can create technical problems in assessing the e dash velocity now we move on to the pulmonary vein flow uh, velocity assessment and this is a typical uh, pulmonary vein flow assessment where we can see the systolic uh, velocity peak systolic wave peak diastolic wave and the atrial reversal uh, peak velocity and also that the time uh, interval between the uh, end of di uh, uh, diastolic wave to the initiation uh, to the end of atrial reversal wave is called as the atrial reversal duration uh, uh, so this is again also used for assessment of lv uh, diastolic function so apical four chamber and four color flow imaging helps uh, to position the pulse wave doppler volume position just in fact 5 to 10 mm inside the right upper pulmonary vein and in fact we should take that uh, take into consideration that the signal gain is set out to be at the lowest so s by t ratio is the ratio of the peak anterograde velocities in systole and diastole normally s is more than the uh, systolic component is more than the diastolic component so systolic fraction is the de is defined as the duration of the ratio of systolic to the diastolic time velocity integral the duration of the retrograde atrial wave which is the ar duration increases with increased filling pressure or the left atrial pressure and the difference between the ar duration and the a wave duration which we had seen earlier in the e day, e and a velocity durations in fact if the difference more than 30 millisecond again reflects abnormal lv diastolic component and indicates elevated lv filling pressures so these are the typical patterns where we can see that uh, the, uh, the diastolic component is gaining prominence here the diastolic component is very much prominent in the mitral vein flow inflow velocities then also here we can see in fact the total blunting of the systolic component and prominence of the diastolic component so these are the various patterns of mitral vein flow patterns in progressive diastolic dysfunction so s by d ratio again is affected by several parameters and the technical challenges in obtaining in the recordings age extremes of heart rate pulse uh, pr interval mitral regurgitation and systolic function are some of the variables which affect the assessment uh, accurate assessment of s by d ratio mitral inflow uh, propagation velocity it is uh, the assessment starts with the by achieving a four chamber view m mode cursor is placed in the center of the column of the mitral inflow signal as parallel to the flow direction in fact we can see this is the apical four chamber view and placing the m mode color with a color component is placed just at the tip of the mitral inflow and we we assess from the apex to valve configuration of the uh, uh, the ventricular diastolic function uh, assessment where we can see the vertical rapid vp slope so slope of the early diastolic valve to apex control so this is basically valve this is the valvular side of the mitral annular plane and this is the apex side basically so valve to apex contour this, this particular slope of this uh, uh, mitral inflow propagation velocity will uh, is termed as the vp and this are some of the uh, patterns uh, reflected in vp so basically this is where we can see the normal uh, vp component with a uh, signal more than 50 cm per second and here we can see the almost flattening out of the vp velocity which denotes severe progressive diastolic dysfunction so impaired relaxation will show the pro, uh, propagation of blood and thereby reduce the slope of the line which is the vp and also indirect parameter e by vp more than 2.5 will again uh, uh, in fact reflect increase lv filling pressures or increase pulmonary capillary wedge pressure so vp is again affected by various parameters of this in fact the important are the ventricular geometry regional disc synchrony and systole at particularly depressor lv function so of this now that we have discussed some of the parameters uh, uh, in fact are uh, very much independent or are less age dependent so these are e by e dash ratio change in mitral inflow velocities with valsalva and the, the difference between the ar duration and the a duration also there is a complementary role of speckle tracking and strain imaging and stress echo in the assessment of diastolic dysfunction 
which is beyond the discussion of our uh, today's talk so with with the variables uh, uh, many variables which are uh, utilized in the ass assessing the lv uh, diastolic function of this in fact e by e dash ratio uh, septal and lateral e dash velocities e by uh, d acceleration time ar duration uh, difference ar duration and uh, the a wave duration difference are very important and with uh, uh, we should be we should also keep in mind that the septal e dash velocity uh, less the more than 8 lateral e dash velocity more than 10 and la volume index uh, less than 34 denotes normal diastolic function but normal uh, septal and e uh, lateral e dash with increase uh, la volume index would also denote normal diastolic function or the athlete's heart component and also sometimes we have a underlying situation of pericardial constriction of this when we have altered septal or lateral e dash along with increased uh, lavi basically more than 34 ml per meter square then we have to look out for grading of the lv diastolic component and depending upon the ea ratio as what we have discussed earlier and the d acceleration time we can grade the lv diastolic dysfunction into grade 1 2 or 3 So diastolic function uh, assessment is particularly important also in presence of atrial fibrillation and the parameters which are to be relied are particularly the deceleration time particularly if it is less than 160 milliseconds it denotes again a uh, lv diastolic dysfunction and in fact lv uh, deceleration time less than 130 milliseconds denotes poor survival in most of the subjects iv rt less than 65 milliseconds e by e dash more than uh, 11 are all the are, are other parameters which are to be relied for assessment of lv diastolic function particularly when we are uh, dealing in a subset of atrial uh, fibrillation patient e by e dash ratio to estimate lv filling pressure in mitral uh, valve pathologies is almost unreliable and in fact some of the parameters are uh, which make it unreliable are uh, significant mitral valve annular calcification mitral stenosis significant mitral regurgitation and prosthetic uh, mitral valve so this uh, the presence of this pathologies will again in fact hamper our assessment of lv filling pressures so coming back to our case in fact uh, Uh, with a uh, diabetic hypertensive 66 year female who, who is uh, symptomatic with class 2 dyspnea and elevated anti pro bnp levels and the typical echocardiographic assessment in our patient has uh, revealed the patient is having parameters which are suggestive of the grade 2 diastolic dysfunction where e by e ratio is more than 0.5 e by e dash ratio is uh, more than 10 uh, depicting increased lv filling pressures and also that e by vp ratio is more than 2.5 so Taking help of the uh, uh, American Society uh, echocardiographic uh, algorithm, given in our case that we have these parameters which are altered, and in fact, uh, patient has more than in fact the in fact patient has all the three variables altered in our case with e by e dash ratio more than ten, TR velocity more than two point eight, and LA uh, LAVI index more than thirty uh, ml per meter square. In fact, all the three criteria are fulfilled in our case, and in fact, we can uh, we uh, we assume that the patient is having. based on this algorithm patient is having grade 2 diastolic dysfunction with increased la pressure and also we have a indirect uh, 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 the biomarker nt pro bnp level uh, significantly elevated in our case uh, which depicts that the patient is symptomatic the nt pro bnp levels are elevated and also the echocardiographic parameters are in favor of grade 2 diastolic dysfunction so a clinical diagnosis of diastolic heart failure in our case is uh, uh, is arrived uh, uh, taking into the consideration of the anti pro bnp levels and the echocardiographic parameters so basically we have diastolic dysfunction grade 2 and symptomatic heart failure in our case so basically coming for uh, to the end of our talk the key points diastolic function and filling pressure are assessed by integrated echo doppler parameters and correlate well with the symptomatology and the cardiac uh, biomarkers <clears throat> recognizing the special situations and limitations of doppler are also important particularly situations like atrial fibrillation extremes of heart heart rate high output states mitral valve pathologies is important when assessing the lv diastolic parameters abnormal lv relaxation is one of the first manifestation of diastolic dysfunction mitral annulus e dash velocity is a clinically reliable parameter for lv relaxation uh, impairment and e by e dash ratio more than 14 is specific for increased lv filling pressures so this uh, brings to the end of our talk thank you hello everyone this is uh, dr kumal shah and today we'll be discussing the concept of sample size 
So there's a case where first year residents wants to calculate the sample size for his thesis, where he wants to assess the utility of IV US assisted PCI as compared to those undergoing without that imaging technology. Then how should we calculate the sample size for this kind of cases? So first of all, it is critical to understand the study design and methodology that we want to opt for, for addressing this research question. So the students is having this kind of study design, which is displayed over here for his particular study. So it is a randomized controlled parallel trial where two study groups will be included. First would be the intervention arm where IUVS guided PCI technology will be used. And second one would be the control technology where conventional angiography guided PCI will be used. Now we need to be really specific about the outcome that we want to assess for this particular research study. So over here, the students want to assess the outcome in terms of target vessel failure at 12 months. So this has been critically described further in three indicators where cardiac death, MI, or target vessel revascularization are considered. So with this basic information about the research design or a study design, we need to understand the concepts of sample size. So the number of subjects or the participants that need to be included in the study, that is by and large known as sample size. It is one of the most critical concepts and aspects of the study design, especially we, if we are going ahead with an RCT, that is randomized controlled trial, which is needed for accurate inference of the findings that we are getting. If we are having incorrect sample size, it means that we might end up having misleading results. Uh, by and large, there is no magic formula. The sample size calculation varies from uh, type of study and the study design that we are choosing. So it is not one size that can fit all the study designs. So for this particular study, we will be discussing what could be the minimum requirements that we need to have. So the sample size can be calculated by various methodology. Classically, there are equations available which can be used manually and the data can be entered in those equations and you can get your sample size. Apart from that, nowadays, there are various software which are available, which are free also and which are uh, uh, purchasable software also. Based on need of the individual and the study, we can purchase or use the free software. But before we go ahead with any of this tool, we need to understand that what would be the minimum information that is needed to calculate the sample size. So over here, I have tried to list down those information which are needed prior. Uh, we go ahead with the sample size calculation. So first of all, we should be ready with the confidence interval. Confidence interval is generally considered or taken up at 95%, but you may vary it based on your study design. So for this particular study, 95% of the confidence interval was taken up by the student. Then power of the study, how much confidence or power I want to impart to my study, that should be a minimum limit for this kind of study. Then ratio of cases to control or exposed to unexposed. So how many individuals I'm planning to take up or enroll in my intervention now, as well as how many I want to enroll in my control or unexposed. Um, that particular ratio should be very clear in my mind. Then something which will be needed before I go ahead with the sample size calculation. Now there will be question in your mind then, how do we obtain this information? The four or five factors that I uh, mentioned in the previous time. So for that, there are various ways. The first and very popular way, you go through the prior published literature and identify what is the odds, how the uh, uh, controlled uh, people were enrolled, how the cases were enrolled, what were their criteria and what were their findings. So the most common and very popular way is to rely on the prior published literature. The second one, if nothing is published in that area, you should go ahead with the expert opinion. People who are already working in that area, you can ask them about the uh, expected outcome. What could be the outcome of interest when you are um, uh, 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 taking care of this kind of study? Then if that is also not available, you need to go ahead with the primary study. You yourself need to run a pilot study uh, to understand the 
and be sure of your outcome of interest and then you can design one large study. So we have the citation as well as uh, the study details over here, which are referred for the sample size calculation. Yeah. So this is about the type of information that I have extracted from that particular study. I was interested in the total number of participants in each group. So the study that I have retrieved from the literature, uh, it has taken up uh, 724 individuals in both the arm, in my intervention as well as my control arm. Now the next question or the next information that I require is my outcome of interest. What was the impact of PCI that was guided through IVUS as well as angiography uh, on the outcome? So we hear my primary outcome was target vessel failure at 12 months, exactly the same that I'm planning to take up. So I was fortunate to get this article and uh, uh, I need to dig out the result from this particular article, which I'll be using for my sample size calculation. So they found out that in 2.9% of the individuals my intervention arm, these events occurred in contrast to 5.4, which, uh, which I will, I'll be needing and using for my sample size calculation. Okay, so now moving ahead, what are we supposed to do with this information? So this is one very uh, commonly used software, user-friendly uh, and freely available software for sample size calculation that is known as OpenAPI that I have used over here. As you can see, the circle which is marked over here, that uh, that area gives you information about sample size calculation. So moving further, when you click the sample size, uh, you will be provided the option, whether you want to go ahead with the proportion, unmatched case control, cohort or RCT and mean difference. So over here, my study requires a sample size calculation for an RCT. So when I click that particular area, this kind of window will be opened. And as you can see, all the information that I have extracted from my previous article are mentioned over here. So that information I need to add in this software. The first section is about the confidence interval. We need to mention that which would be the minimum confidence interval that we'll be taking up in a two-sided manner. So we here, statistically, generally 95% of the confidence interval is the most effective and accepted uh, uh, threshold. Then what would be my power of study? So minimum power of the study for this kind of studies are selected as 80%. So this is what I'm selecting. Then ratio of unexposed to exposed in the sample. I want to run an RCT where both the arms will have similar number of patients or participants. So I'll be putting my ratio as one. I can change it as per my need also, one is to two or any other ratio. But for my this study, I will be needing one. Then percentage of unexposed with the outcome and percentage of exposed with the outcome, odds ratio and rest of the other information. Now, this information I have uh, collected from my previously published article. So when I add this information in this particular software, it will be uh, looking like this. The window will be uh, like this. So 5.4% was my incidence of that event in my control arm. So that is the information I need to add in the percentage of unexposed with the outcome. Whereas the contradictory um, information that is related to my intervention, that needs to be added in the percentage to information in the software. The software will be calculating the odds ratio, prevalence and rest of the things by its own. So I don't need to add that particular thing. I just need to add, uh, click the calculate button and uh, you can see at the right hand side, the sample size is calculated. So this is the sample size that I will be uh, needing for my this particular study. And uh, generally, it gives you through uh, two, three techniques or two, three methods. So generally, we take up something which is coming as the highest one. So over here, I can go ahead with two, one, double two. Now, there are certain issues with this kind of sample size calculation whenever you are going ahead with even with software or uh, uh, manual calculation because it heavily depends on the published literature that you are using and your study design. So at time, there are possibility that uh, over here, my primary outcome was only one, but there are chances that uh, for some kind of study, I might have more than one primary outcome. And there are cases that um, 
the primary outcome related information are quite contradictory in the published literature. So I might not have 2.9 and 5.6 as the only percentage which is available. So I might need to calculate the sample size for lot many other percentage or other outcome uh, related finding also. So in that case, there is always a way out. You need to calculate the sample size for all of this outcome in all the situation. Even your primary outcome has got two indicators. You need to calculate the sample size for all of them and take up the sample size, which is highest. So highest sample size, when you are choosing, it gives you an uh, um, uh, assurance that um, uh, all of your significance outcome will be covered with that sample size. Those, so this is how you go ahead with that sample size calculation when you have multiple outcomes to consider. These are some of the resources that I have referred over here. I have given references for manual calculation of the sample size, as well as I've given you the links for uh, uh, size calculations. The softwares are also accompanied by the tutorials, which are very easy to understand. And this is my contact detail. In case of any query, you can refer and contact me to this detail. Thank you very much. Hi, um, good evening, everyone. So today's uh, this talk is about understanding basic statistics when we look at multiple trials. It's about net number to treat as it is mentioned. This is an important topic because this goes on to tell you what is the efficacy of a therapy vis a vis say other therapies, because this tells you what number of patients you need to treat to achieve one event reduction over what period of time. And hence, you may have multiple trials coming in for multiple therapies, for multiple options, for multiple indications. But when you have to weigh out between the therapies to assess as to what was the care that resulted into what impact in the outcomes, you need to look at a number called net number to treat or number needed to treat. So uh, uh, this basically uh, we'll discuss today in this talk. Um, uh, basically, we before I jump on to that, let me take you to two important concepts. One is IE and IU. IE is the probability of seeing no improvement after receiving the therapy. So this is the inverse of probability of seeing the improvement. So this measure applies only to a treated group. So when you have a treated group, you look at IE and you see if what would be the outcome not improving the probability that you find on it. And IU is also referred as a probability of seeing no improvement after receiving the control therapy. And based on this, then you amplify and look at the net number to treat. So this measures applies only to control group, uh, the IU and the control group may receive a placebo treatment and or the standard care as we know on top of the existing new treatment. And this is what you get as the probability outcome in IU. So the meaning of net number to treat or not need number needed to treat is dependent whether the control group received a placebo treatment or an existing treatment that is the standard care versus placebo care and in case where placebo is given the net number to treat is also affected by the quality of placebo for example sham procedures as we know in renal denervation therapy when patients were taken inside cath lab and they were not delivered renal denervation therapy but they had a sham procedure a procedure patient who did not know they actually underwent the procedure or not there was a good amount of reduction in the blood pressure in this renal denervation subgroup despite actually not getting the innervation therapy. It's just a sham procedure the patients were undergoing in the control group. So the type of placebo, for example, injectables versus OSIL, OSIL uh, oral therapies would also have different outcomes in terms of the impact of the placebo. Now, these are some formulas that I should thought I thought I'll talk about before I jump on to uh, number needed to treat. We all have a very simple table and uh, there will be some more talks that people will tell you about the odds ratio, etc. But I'm just going to summarize all of them in brief. Uh, you can see there are two groups. We when we take a study, you will have an experimental group and a control group. So let's assume that the experimental group or the therapy group, which has been receiving on uh, the new therapy is of say 150 patients while the control group is of 250 patients now assume that out of 150 patients there are 15 events say death if, if you're looking at that as an important indicator so say assuming that there are 15 events in the experimental group and out of 250 of the control group the patients receiving only uh, the placebo or the standard care there are 100 events now this goes on to tell you the event rates now event rate would be just the ratio of the number of events out of total subjects so in the experimental group it will be 10 percent 
while in control group it is 40% or if you take uh, define it in decimals it will be 0.1 and 0.4 now what is the absolute risk reduction it is repre representing the difference between the two event rates so we have 40% in control group event rate 10% of in a con uh, experimental uh, uh, group rate so the difference between the two is 30%. So 40% in control, 10% in experimental. Hence, the absolute risk reduction is 30%. Now, relative risk reduction is the percentage change from the baseline. Now, if you look, compared to say 0.4, there is a reduction to 0.1 is about 75% reduction. So 75% reduction has taken place from 10, 40% to 10%. And relative risk reduction looks though very huge, but absolute risk reduction is only 30%. Now, net number to treat is arrived at as by one upon absolute risk reduction, one upon absolute risk reduction. So then if you that would be assessing as to how many patients do you treat to prevent one event. Now, absolute risk reduction is 30 percent reduction is achieved in every patient. So in how many patients you need to treat so that there is one event prevented? So one event is prevented. So if 1% is person, you in, in every person, the risk reduces by 30%, it will become one or 100% when the number of patients needed to be treated is one upon absolute risk reduction, which is one upon 30% and multiplied by 100, you will get it 3.33. So you need to treat 3.33 patients to uh, reduce one event. Now, this is important to define as to what you're looking at. So risk ratio and odds ratio are different things. Risk ratio uh, is, again, the ratio between uh, the uh, uh, EER upon CER. So EER is the uh, event rate in the experimental group, and CER is the control event rate. And then you divide the two is the risk ratio. So here you have 0.25. Um, when odds ratio is, of course, AD by BC, as we call it, so odds ratio is the EE by EN upon CE by CN, which is uh, the events in experimental group upon events, uh, non-events in experimental group divided by control uh, events and the control non-events. And this odds ratio is here 0 0.697. So, and there is another factor called as preventable fraction among the AN exposed, which I am not talking today. So one of the examples I will try to give you so that you can understand how to comprehend this. Uh, real life example, say, would be the ASCOT LLA trial. So this is the trial where the atorvastatin 10 milligrams was started in patients on hypertension, but no previous CV disease. Now this trial ran for 3.3 years. And during this period, the primary event, which was defined as a new onset of MI, new onset of heart attack, not death, new heart attack was reduced by 36% in a relative risk. Now, what does it mean? Now, if you look at 36% overall risk reduction here, that this, this difference was though relative, absolute difference between the two arms was not this much. It was the event rate of MI in the patients not receiving atorvastatin or NESCOT LLA trial was 2.67%. While in treatment arm, it was 1.65% in the patients who received atorvastatin and had hypertension. So the MI rate, between the two groups, over a period of 3.3 years, the difference was only 1.02%, which is nothing but the difference between the absolute risk between the two groups. That is 2.67 minus 1.65. So the absolute risk reduction is 1.02% over 3.3 years to prevent one MI, one myocardial infarction, one heart attack. So to get the net number to treat, you will divide 1 upon 1.02 multiplied by 100, which would turn out to be 98.04, almost 100 because 1%, right? So you need to treat 98.04 patients with atorvastatin, 10 milligrams for 3.3 years to prevent one heart attack in patients with hypertension with no history of previous CV disease. That is how you interpret ESCOT LLA trial. So every trial, when they come up with a number, you look at the number of patients. So you have to prescribe atorvastatin to a patient with hypertension but no CV disease for 3.3 years. Once you prescribe it to 98 patients, you will have prevented one myocardial infarction. That's how you interpret net number to treat. Thank you. I'm Kritika Patel. I'm working as research fellow 
at UN, UN Mehta Institute of Cardiology and Research Center. Today, my session is on statistics test, odds ratio, and hazard ratio. Odds ratio. Odds ratio is a measure of association which quantifies the relationship between an exposure and outcome from a comparative study. When we are doing comparative studies like case control study, we can see inside the table two groups, exposed and unexposed. For simple equation of odds, odds that a case was exposed upon odds that a control was exposed is equal to AD upon BC. Odds is a numeric expression of the strength of association between cause and effect when both expressions as categorical variable. A thumb rule for use odds ratio is both variables are categorical variables. The increase in risk associated with each odds depends on the rate of the outcome in the study. Odds show only correlation of two variables, not causation. It means two, when we can see the correlation between two variables, but we cannot found any cause between two variables. Odds ratio is a simple tool widely utilized in case control studies, clinical research, and meta-analysis. Calculations of odd can be done easily with the help of an online calculators and software like SPSS, Tata, and Medcal. We can, I can show you some calculations of odds. In for example one, in 100 birds, the probability of delivering being a boy is 51% and being a girl is 49%. The odds of a delivery being boy is 51 upon 49 is equal to 1.04. This is our odds. Odds in simple equation, number of event occur upon non-event. And we can discuss example two. This is a clinical example for odds. In study examining the association between estrogen, this is exposure and endometrial carcinoma. This is outcome. This calculation is shown in this table. According to the table above, individual with endometrial cancer are 4.42 times more likely to be exposed to estrogen than those without endometrial carcinoma. Then interpretation of odds. Odds ratio is equal to 1. This indicate exposure does not affect odds of outcome. Odds is greater than 1. This indicates exposure associated with higher odds of outcome. If odds is less than 1, this indicates exposure associated with lower odds of outcome. Then we can discuss the another test, hazard ratio. Hazard ratio are frequently used to estimate the event effect for time to event endpoints. A time to event analysis analyzes the time from the start of the study. For example, randomization in study to event to an event, for example, death. Hazard ratio allows a measure of association in outcome in survival curves. Main goal of hazard ratio, how one group changes relative to another. Hazard ratio represents the instantaneous event rate, which means the probability then an individual has survived to that particular point of time without experiencing any event. The hazard ratio is measure of risk. For example, in case of hazard ratio is two, means the event will occur twice as often at each time point give one unit increase the second uses of hazard ratio in survival analysis to compare the risk of occurrence of an event of interest for example death in two groups for example treatment versus control group at a given time hazard ratio used in observational study randomized clinical trials and prospective cohort studies Hazard ratio received from survival analysis like kaplan meier Cox regression, and log rank text. It can be also calculated from statistical software. Now we can see interpretation of hazard ratio. Hazard ratio, if hazard ratio is equal to 1, means lack of association between 
two groups. If hazard ratio greater than one, suggest group two are at increased hazard compared to group one. If hazard ratio is less than one, suggest group two are at decreased hazard compared to group one, a smaller risk. Now this is the this is curve of Kaplan-Meier curve. This show a time to event progression. Uh, red light indicates treatment group and blue line indicates control group. When the decrease is in the graph, it shows end of the study. The time to event curve or Kaplan-Meier curve as time progress percentage survival decrease in both groups. Plotting curves on the graphs allow statistical analysis to be performed to calculate the hazard for each group. Hazard model only determines whether the treatment are different or not, but do not indicate how much one treatment is better or worse than the other. This is called the limitation of hazard ratio. Dividing the hazard The, uh, dividing the hazard ratio in the control room produces the hazard ratio. One study performed by Clinical Journal of American Society of Nephrology, the title is, is AKI associated with higher risk of cardiovascular events one year after discharge? They, they take large number of cohort patients matches with AKI and without AKI. After post discharge, they take follow up of after one year, they take follow up of these patients. After one year, they found primary outcome heart failure, acute coronary syndrome, periphery arterial disease, and ischemic stroke. These all are primary outcome. In four of them, hazard ratio of heart failure is 1.4. So we can conclude that AKI is independently associated with this event especially heart failure after after discharge thank you for listening me hello everyone i am eva patil working with un meta institute of cardiology and research center and research assistant today here i am going to talk about relative risk and absolute risk what is relative risk relative risk is the ratio of probability of an outcome in exposed group to the probability of an outcome in an exposed group it shows the relationship between exposure and outcome relative risk is used in ecological data cohort study random clinical trial adverse drug reaction and intervention studies it requires two binary variable one is an event occurred or not, and another is exposure group, exposed and unexposed group. How to interpret the relative risk? Relative risk greater than one indicates the increased risk in the exposure group in comparison to the unexposed group. Relative risk less than one indicates the exposure have less risk than the unexposed group. And relative risk is equal to one means both have same risk. How to calculate the relative risk? Here I, I have shown one table of uh, here predictor and outcome variable. Uh, relative risk is equal to A upon A plus B uh, upon C upon C plus per D. Let's take one example over here. Uh, incidence in exposed group upon incidence in unexposed group. Uh, that is, I have taken an example of uh, lung disease present and absent in the event group and in the exposure group, uh, smoker and non-smoker. So the incidence in the exposed group, that is 800 divided by 1000. So it is 0 0.8 and incidence in unexposed group, that is 40 divided by 2000, that is 0 0.02. Converting this decimal into the percentage, uh, 80 by 2, that means 40%. It means that uh, in the exposure group, there is a 40% risk of having a lung disease in comparison to the unexposed group. Uh, RR can, relative risk can become extremely large when the chances of an event in the unexposed group is low. The, uh, here I have taken one example that uh, 
इट इज पब्लिश बाय वोगेल चेंग एट ऑल इन 2050 इज एम वाज टू क्वांटिफाई द मॉर्टेलिटी रिस्क ऑफ इंफेक्शन इन डायलिसिस एंड किडनी ट्रांसप्लांट पेशेंट इन हिज रिजल्ट ही फाउंड 82 फोल्ड हायर uh with the uh, infection related mortality in dialysis and uh, kidney transplant patient in comparison to the general population means on exposed group and uh, uh, he, in his study he found that women each ages between 20 to 29 years the mortality rate ratio was high is 565 meaning that the women in that age category who were treated with dialysis had a 565 times higher uh, risk of dying from infection than women of same age in the general unexposed group the number is tremendously high that is due to the uh, occur occurrence of the death from the infection that is very low in the general population that is 0.01 per 1000 patient per year in general population most of the time we use the relative risk in the meta analysis study there is one drawback that they do not give a true reflection of how much benefit the individual would would derive from the intervention as they cannot discriminate between small and large treatment effect they usually tend to overestimate the benefit of intervention and for that reason most of the drug company uses relative risk of the, this drawback can overcome by the absolute risk is uh, that reflects the baseline risk better and that discriminate between small and large treatment groups now going to the absolute risk okay what is absolute risk risk can be expressed in absolute terms by the absolute risk difference it's also called attributable risk absolute risk is the number of people experiencing an event in relation to the that population at risk it is also individual risk of some event happening in that particular group how to calculate absolute risk that is absolute risk in the exposed group that is positive event in the unexposed exposed group upon total number of cases in the exposed group and uh, absolute risk in uh, unexposed group that is same uh, positive event in the unexposed group divided by total number of cases in the unexposed group formula to calculate absolute risk difference most of the time we shows the absolute risk different attributable risk that is subtracting the incidence risk among an unexposed group from the incidence risk among exposed group that is a upon a plus b minus c upon c plus d i have taken one example that shows you the difference between the relative risk and the absolute risk in the figure 1 and in the next slide in both the figure there are 60 and 60 subjects are present in both the group the black black shows the outcome of interest and white shows the, the, the cases didn't have any outcome of interest here in the uh, figure 1 there is a lesser number of outcome in comparison to the figure 2 here the relative risk is 1.67 means 67% relative risk over here and the cases are very outcome is very low and absolute risk over here is 2% and uh, it is showing lesser a lesser outcome and the lesser absolute risk over here in the figure 2 there is a outcome outcome is higher outcome of interest is higher in comparison to the group uh, figure 1 here the relative risk is same as in figure 1 and the absolute risk is 24% so here as the outcome increases the absolute risk increases and the relative risk is same in both the uh, both figure 1 and figure 2 so the relative risk sometimes gives us an incomplete 
incomplete data, incomplete result in comparison to the absolute risk that gives us precise research. And that's why most of the drug company uses and shows us relative risk that so and so drug reduces the incidence by uh, 50, 60 percent. But if we uh, count the absolute risk, if we analyze their absolute risk, then it is uh, it shows the precise data. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Deepak Shrivastava. Today, my topic is to discuss uh, resistant hypertension and obstructive sleep apnea, a relationship between them, and can we avoid this threat and the complications related to these two disorders. I'm very happy to be here today speaking at the CardioCon 2022 and very grateful to the Scientific Committee Chair, Dr. Kamal Sharma, as well as the members of the Scientific Committee. Let's uh, start with the scope of the problem, what we are dealing with. The resistant hypertension certainly causes a lot of end organ damage, as uh, this astute audience knows very well, and that relates with the cardiovascular disease, including the uh, problems with the cardiac problems as well as the uh, stroke. There are significant challenges when it comes to the management. Uh, they relate with the challenges uh, with the medical management, but also the lifestyle management issues um, and the management of the uh, end organ damage. The prevalence is really um, wide range depending on where we get the information from, somewhere between 2% to 40% as you can see. But you remember the all head trial, um, which was a few years ago, uh, but had come up with some significant findings here that the hazard ratio with the resistant hypertension uh, is pretty high when it comes to coronary artery disease, uh, stroke, heart failure, and stage kidney disease, and all-cause mortality. So there's almost twice as much uh, risk of these complications uh, when the patient has resistant uh, hypertension or a refractory hypertension, and we'll uh, get into that in the next few slides. Increased rate of resistant hypertension and coronary artery disease and CKD compared to the general population. And this is common knowledge. Uh, there is nothing uh, else that I'm adding new to it, except that what the all had trial has shown many, many years ago, and we are still facing the same problem. The obstructive sleep apnea, and we'll learn a little bit about obstructive sleep apnea today, is definitely associated with uh, essential hypertension as well as a resistant hypertension. And then again, we really do not know exactly what the prevalence of this finding is. Um, there was one study that showed that there is about 70% correlation between these two disorders. Uh, there are other studies which go as high as up to 85% or 90% of the cases uh, with resistant hypertension will have uh, obstructive sleep apnea. But when you compare it with the general population, it's about only 40%. So you can see the impact of resistant hypertension and how it correlates with the presence or absence of the obstructive sleep apnea will affect uh, the end organ damage and at the end of the day, quality of the life. So patients have to be screened uh, for the possibility of obstructive sleep apnea, uh, which is relatively easier to do by way of interview, and then we'll talk about some of the screening tools. And then at the end of the day, you really have to do a test that will actually tell us whether they have obstructive sleep apnea or they do not have obstructive sleep apnea. And then treatment with CPAP uh, is definitely very uh, modest uh, result with a blood pressure change for millimeters of mercury systolic and two millimeters of mercury diastolic. Um, but when you take a population, a subset of the patients who have the resistant hypertension, the effect seems to be a little larger. And we will examine that fact. Uh, what are some of the estimates here? So we really have to get to the bottom of the true resistant hypertension. So if you really look at it's about 10% of the treated hypertension population. So first of all, we look at the hypertension 
uh, what the prevalence of the hypertension and then we start coning down to the point where we rule out the pseudo uh, resistant hypertension and uh, the secondary causes of the hypertension and as you would notice that there are a number of uh, secondary causes of uh, hypertension uh, you know the renal diseases uh, then so the endocrine diseases uh, anatomical distortions and uh, then obstructive sleep apnea has been there for some time now uh, as a significant uh, cause or secondary cause of hypertension So here's the definition of the uh, resistant hypertension, but the key point here is do they have to be on three or more antihypertensives that includes different classes of drugs, including a diuretic. Um, and then, of course, the causes of pseudo-resistant hypertension. You already know these. Uh, I don't have to read this slide. Um, but more important thing is that this number here, that uh, nearly 120 million people suffer with resistant hypertension across the world. So this infographic was very, very useful for me, uh, and I do show it to uh, my patients and colleagues uh, when it comes to, and what it does to these 120 million people is uh, increases their um, cardiac risk uh, by threefold, which is a very, very high. Uh, risk as, as you would notice. It also impacts their quality of life significantly um, with the mood, self-esteem, um, their personal life and so on. So the impact is very very high to a significant number of uh, population around the world. So let's switch gear slightly and look at the prevalence of the obstructive sleep apnea and the spectrum of the obstructive sleep apnea is pretty much uh, that it starts with the snoring and we all know that there is hardly anybody on the face of the earth who sometimes does not snore. You not necessarily have to snore every night, but there are certain things that happen. Uh, you are tired. Somebody had a, a drink of uh, alcohol or using some pain medication uh, sedatives and those nights you will have. Or you are sleeping on your back. So in supine position, you snore more when you're uh, sleeping on the side. But snoring is very interesting because it tells us that there is something wrong with the airway. I always tell the medical students that God has provided us with a trumpet to tell you that there is something wrong with the airway and you have to really examine it. Uh, but let's look at this slide here very, very quickly. This is a, um, a number of years here uh, at the uh, x-axis and the y-axis at the percentage of, uh, of uh, prevalence of the snoring in this population. Um, then you can see they are both male and female, but as we continue to age, the, the appearance of the snoring or the um, incidence of the snore or prevalence of the snoring, I should say, continues to rise uh, all the way towards the late middle life, uh, I should say, and then there is a little dip, but then it picks up again. Um, so overall, in this Italian study, 40% of the men and 28% of the women, which is much higher incidence than obstructive sleep apnea, uh, snore. And uh, this is a major sign that there is something wrong with the airway. Uh, let's look at the OSA, why it is such a major issue. But if you look at this uh, slide here, uh, this is the age range here at the x-axis and then percentage of claim lines from the insurance records uh, to find out that um, people are getting a sleep consultation, getting a sleep study done, are being diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea, and are treated for, for obstructive sleep apnea. And then these claims were paid by the insurance companies and they were looked at as a surrogate marker for the uh, prevalence of the uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And you can see uh, that uh, middle age, right around when you are over the hill, uh, 40 years or so, all the way to 70, uh, you have the maximum number of people who suffer with obstructive sleep apnea, um, as much as 30% here, 20-20 here. So if you really look at it, almost 70% of the population during their lifetime here is at risk. Well, this is also your most productive time. You are working here, you are part of the workforce, and of course the sleep apnea is going to uh, dampen your performance, um, will make you tired, uh, non-restorative uh, 
tiredness and uh, sleep, which is unrefreshing, uh, can cause a lot of problems. This is also the age when you begin to have those um, diseases, the chronic diseases like hypertension or uh, diabetes and others, uh, which will uh, cause a great deal of disability uh, towards the uh, older years. So this is a significant problem uh, that we are facing and the, we are facing it for now at least three to four decades. Um, this cartoon was supposed to work and uh, this is supposed to have an open airway here uh, with breathing in and out and this is uh, as you can see this is a, um, a closed airway during the inspiration and here is the tongue here is the vertebral column so we are looking at the neck here is the cerebellum of the brain the spinal cord so this is a dynamic MRI uh, for some reason the, um, the the software didn't work I uh, apologize for that but it uh, proves the point that uh, it can happen um, to anybody when they are asleep or, or taking a nap during the daytime. And it all relates to all these number of muscles here in our uh, nasopharyngeal area, uh, which are uh, called the pharyngeal dilator muscles. And the most important being the genioglossus muscle or the tongue. Uh, coincident with our inspiration, the muscle tone in the genioglossus and all these other muscles rises and it prevents the collapse of the nasopharynx here because of the negative pressure that we generate in order to pull the air into the uh, lungs. So this is where the problem is right now. We don't quite know that why in the population uh, that suffers with obstructive sleep apnea, this system does not work, whether there is a quantitative or qualitative problem, but there is a disconnect between the inspiration, inspiratory effort, negative pressure in the uh, nasopharynx and uh, lack of increase or concomitant increase in the genioglossus muscle. Uh, people are looking at it. Uh, someday we will find out an explanation for that. Um, this is a simple slide uh, which uh, you know that hypertension is associated with impaired parasympathetic tone so your system does not go down when you are trying to rest and there is increased sympathetic activation. So there is nothing that uh, you did not know and it is responsible for the vascular remodeling, endothelial dysfunction and um, of course uh, the stiffness in the arterial system that causes the hypertensive state. Here in this cartoon, uh, this is from Viren Sommer. Uh, one of our colleagues uh, who many years uh, ago actually studied the sympathetic nerve activity, as you can see here. And um, uh, this is again, he is monitoring the EEG, uh, EOG, EEG, the brain waves, the uh, eye movements, EMG. And the person is uh, happens to be in REM sleep here. Uh, they tend to have more episodes of uh, obstructive sleep apnea. As the legend says here, you can see there is complete apnea, then some movement. And then here the airway opens and the person breathes. And during the obstructive sleep apnea event, you can see that there is a significant rise in the sympathetic nerve activity. And that is all over the body. And you can also see the increase in the blood pressure goes all the way up to about uh, 200 in this particular uh, slide, which of course it will be variable from one person to the other, uh, some more, some less. But this is a very nice slide to really reflect on that what exactly happens. And if I had to show just one slide for this talk, I would have chosen this uh, slide from the uh, uh, Tom Bradley, um, where he's showing that here is the uh, obstructed airway. You can see the trachea. Uh, there is pharyngeal collapse, uh, obstructive apnea. That means there is no air flowing for 10 seconds or longer will result in increase in CO2, which will normalize very soon as soon as the airway opens. But more importantly, uh, the PaO2, the oxygen, goes down. And oxygen goes down, which leads to a decrease in the myocardial oxygen supply. The chemoreceptors get stimulated. Um, again, the sympathetic nerve activity increases, causes the arousal uh, of the person, which has its own set of problems with the sleep fragmentation and non-restorative sleep in the morning because these episodes can happen up to 300, 400 times uh, in a 
a sleep period of eight hours. But what also happens is uh, that if you look at it, that um, this myocardial su uh, supply is happening because once the airway is closed, our defense mechanism is, what would you do if somebody is choking you? You try to breathe harder and uh, you generate more negative pressure in your chest cavity. And that leads to increase in the transmural pressure in the left ventricle. And then, of course, uh, your inspiratory pressure has to be very high in order to open the airway. That's exercise and uh, body wants to live. So brain uh, snaps you out of the sleep. So maybe for an onlooker, eyes are closed. Your behavior is that you are asleep, but in fact, the brain is awake. And that's where uh, you have this uh, continued sleep fragmentation night from night, which has both um, the, the physical, uh, so cardiovascular, um, neurocognitive, and uh, metabolic uh, problems uh, resulting uh, from the sleep apnea. But here, if you look at it, if the transmural pressure is going to be high, your afterload is high, so you have a more myocardial oxygen demand. Now, in the setting of the more demand, now your supply is down, uh, you can fill in the blanks. Uh, this this group knows this better than I would ever know uh, that what happens uh, subsequently, and which is listed on this slide here. Uh, recently, uh, pharmaceutics, uh, a pharmacy general actually come out, uh, came out with this uh, interesting uh, graphic and uh, they have talked about everything that we already know, but they have put sleep apnea as a separate uh, entity here for uh, secondary hypertension, did not lump it, but also went ahead and talked about some of the screening tests, uh, sleepiness scales and stop bank questionnaires, and in fact, recommend polysomnography. So. Uh, People are beginning to get a little more education about this, and this is becoming the part of the guidelines. Um, so what do we do here? Here is the uh, effort sleepiness scale. It's a, it's a very um, simple questionnaire, has eight questions, uh, which ask you about uh, your chances of falling asleep uh, during certain activities, and you get a score here uh, from zero to three and then if you add up uh, 24 is the maximum you can get normal is sort of so depending on uh, how you look at the cutoff values uh, 0 to 7 or 0 to 10 but clearly uh, 12 to 24 is highly abnormal but the problem is that the sensitivity is just too low the range is too wide the specificity if anything is modest and accuracy is just a little over 50 50. so uh, uh, when this was, this was validated against the PSG, but when it is validated against the home sleep test, uh, then, uh, you know, it does not change much. Sensitivity and specificity uh, tend to uh, remain in the similar uh, range. So this is good as screening tool. Uh, you cannot make a prediction that somebody based on a uh, score of the uh, first sleepiness scale is going to have sleep apnea. Recently, they came up with a new scale, uh, which is uh, used a stop bang. So it, uh, letters here, four, uh, four and four yes and no questions. So snoring, tiredness, um, observed sleep apnea or high blood pressure, yes or no. And then uh, body weight, uh, age, neck circumference, uh, which is uh, 16 inches for women and 17 inches for men is considered predictive of sleep apnea and if they are male or female. And then again, you add up these points. Um, this the stop bank questionnaire is also highly sensitive with false positive rate, obviously, and has low specificity. And then when it was validated against uh, PSG and home sleep testing, um, this is again uh, not any different. So very high sensitivity with high false uh, positive rates and low specificity or modest specificity at the best. And the third common one is Berlin uh, questionnaire, which is also as old as perhaps the effort sleepiness scale. Uh, it is little more um, granulated with three categories. So one is about the symptoms, snoring, uh, how loud loud snoring is, how often you snore, etc. Uh, and then talks about the effect of the snoring, which is the uh, tiredness, fatigue uh, during the daytime, sleepiness, and so on. And then it gives one 
single question or uh, uh, category actually one single question for high blood pressure and the bmi so if you are obese or not so that is called category three and then you calculate these numbers but looking at the sensitivity and specificity is still uh, no different uh, despite the fact uh, this also has uh, so many variables uh, that we screen for so bottom line is you screen the patients and if they have high score you subject them to a test uh, some of the clinical evaluation findings, of course, I have no intention to go um, into details, uh, but there are a few things that uh, we can make a comment on. For example, nocturia. Well, many of these people have chronic diseases, already have end organ damage, already have uh, uh, diabetes, uh, already have uh, benign prostatic hypertrophy, which can cause nocturia, but uh, because of the obstruction, and when the central blood volume increases uh, as you generate more negative pressure in the chest cavity and the uh, blood gets sucked into the central circulation more, atrial stretch receptors and of course the BNP is secreted and that causes nocturia and that's the physiologic mechanism behind obstructive sleep apnea related uh, nocturia, both mechanical and chemical in that sense. And then, of course, uh, this is common knowledge these days uh, that everybody uh, seems to hear somewhere or the other. Uh, these are the airways, uh, type 4, uh, type 1, sort of normal and completely closed. Everything in between is pretty much effort dependent. So either they have normal airway or abnormal airway. Uh, the typical test is uh, very interesting. Uh, one of my medical students uh, was kind enough to uh, uh, do this on herself. Uh, you can see that the, all these wires, and we will look at some of the snippets from the uh, polysomnography. Uh, so there is nasal cannula, oral cannula. Uh, she has uh, wires here with the EEG um, around the eyes for EOG, um, the EMG, etc. Uh, these two belts, uh, upper belt, actually uh, measures the movement of the chest uh, with the inspiration ex exhalation and the belly. And they have to be in sync with each other. Uh, the paradox movement is that there is obstruction if the chest and uh, abdominal wall are moving in paradoxical system. All these wires go into this uh, head box, which is uh, attached to the computer. And it's kind of a messy situation in real life. If you will see the pictures, it looks like very nice, tidy, but uh, there are wires and everything. Uh, people wonder if uh, they will be able to sleep in the sleep lab, but they do anyway. Um, here in this cartoon, uh, you will notice that uh, this is what we measure. So here is airflow, uh, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, and then airway obstructs around here, and uh, effort continues to increase. Uh, with the chest and the abdomen and then uh, both these um, chest and belly and normal breathing is like you are doing right now your when you inhale your chest comes out and belly comes out because of the uh, viscera gets pushed by the volume of the air filling up the chest so they move in the same direction but once the air flow is stopped and effort continues there is this paradox uh, that starts until uh, the airway opens, awakening takes place, and um, then paradox ends. But coincident with all this, you will notice that the oxygen saturation, which was normal range, uh, somewhere here begins to drop. The recording is a little bit delayed because we are uh, recording, we are measuring the pulse oximeter at the finger or the earlobe uh, where the event is happening inside the chest uh, in terms of the hypoxemia so by the time blood travels uh, you see a little delay in the system and there is something called hypopnea and hypopnea is the reduction in the air airflow by 30 percent so it's not complete cessation of the airflow with uh, continued effort with paradox just like we saw in the last slide and associated with certain amount of desaturation three percent to four uh, percent depending on if you follow the medicare uh, rules or some other guideline. A typical polysomnography screenshot looks busy like this. Uh, it's not quite uh, your familiar EKG tracing. Uh, here is the electrooculogram. Uh, the EEG in this uh, particular slide is only showing two channels, but now we are using six channels. Uh, EMG, uh, EKG, so these are all electrical leads here. 
And then we, we have EMG on both legs, right and left, uh, because these movements also um, help us figure out between the non-REM sleep and the REM sleep, but also a um, lot of movement disorders. And then snoring sounds, uh, airflow we already talked about here. Again, obstructive sleep apnea is showing with the continued effort from the effort channels and oxygen saturation. So this gives us a very nice view of what is going on with the patient in uh, supine position or side position or sometimes prone position as well as what is stage of the sleep. Uh, the computer allows us to do so many things. So here, this is quite a busy slide. You can see that uh, there are a lot more uh, EEG channels, EOG is here like we saw uh, in the last slide and rest of the channels are here. So we, we measure about uh, uh, 20, 22 channels uh, in the real time and there is a video recording that goes on so we can correlate with patient behavior with what's happening with the rest of the body. So very comprehensive test. The good news is there are no needles involved, no IV lines, etc. So nothing invasive and is a comfortable test for the patient. Um, again, as I said, the computer allows it to uh, change the resolution and look uh, closely. Uh, here you can see of your interest uh, that during the episode of the obstructive apnea or when the flow is, uh, is stopped, you can see PVCs and bradycardia as if as a compensatory mechanism, the heart begins to slow down, but then the catecholamines are secreted because of that stress. And then they come around uh, with the uh, cardiac cycles uh, and here is the uh, increase in the heart rate. And uh, this is again, one of those uh, problems that uh, we have to deal with and we see and which has significant effect on the cardiovascular uh, morbidity. And towards the end of the night here, uh, we look at um, the entire night in one shot. So here is 4 a.m. And all those channels are now graphed very nicely. So you can see oxygen saturation. Here you can see the dip in oxygen saturation. Um, and I'll make a shot for you. So here is all these uh, wakefulness state and REM sleep. And during the REM sleep, you can see a lot of apnea going on. And this uh, purple uh, color here is the hypopneas. So all together, they are causing a lot of arousal. So arousal by itself is a significant stress in addition to the hypoxemia that is taking place here for uh, the body. All right, so the treatment. The first line treatment for obstructive sleep apnea is continuous positive airway pressure. I'm sure you have heard. Um, sleep apnea activates a lot of intermediate mechanisms that uh, you are well aware of that becomes a substrate for the future cardiovascular disease. Uh, we already talked about the uh, sympathetic hyperactivity. Um, and until, I should say, 2016, the studies came out, the largest study, multi-center trial, multinational, came out of Australia, uh, favorably known as the McCoy study, which showed that the CPAP does not do anything for the primary and secondary prevention of the cardiovascular disease. Well, we don't have time to talk about the, uh, you know, the good and bad uh, side of this trial, but the bottom line was that the patients really did not use the CPAP for the required uh, amount of time. So, but there, so there is a controversy about the CPAP and the primary and secondary uh, prevention. But when it comes to the cardio, uh, the blood pressure control uh, and the modest effect of the blood pressure on CPAP, there is no controversy. This is well established. We'll go over a couple of trials very quickly in the interest of the time. Uh, many of the observational studies and randomized controlled trials, they do show moderate uh, positive effect and a decrease could be very, very modest. Um, a recent meta-analysis towards the end of the talk, we'll go over this meta-analysis findings. Uh, who responds more when they have resistant hypertension to CPAP if they have younger age, they have a lot of oxygen desaturation, their blood pressure is uh, not well controlled despite the effort uh, and then they are more susceptible to improvement. So uh, there are there is a subset one can identify will be really benefited by the CPAP in this uh, uh, setting. I'm sure this is a, a 2013 trial, uh, Hyparco trial that uh, you, you are familiar with and uh, again this trial also showed that uh, in excess of uh, 70 to 80 percent people uh, have uh, sleep apnea if they have resistant hypertension um, then we will talk about them they, they, they were 
set out to see whether the steep app is going to help uh, or not it was open level randomized multicentral trial 24 teaching hospitals 194 patients and then they did the uh, formal poly polysomnography in all those patients and their sleep apnea was defined as the standard definition apnea hypopnea index that means uh, every hour uh, they have 15 events of either not breathing or not breathing enough with oxygen desaturation um, and that means every fourth minute but many of these patients actually will have uh, more than 30 or 60 or 120 events per hour they applied the CPAP for uh, 12 weeks control the, uh, uh, compared with the control and they found that there is a decrease in 24 hour mean diastolic blood pressure and nighttime blood pressure pattern. The trial was published in JAMA and uh, you can see here the change in the diastolic pressure, change in systolic pressure and uh, 24 hour mean blood pressure. Rather than going into the numbers, and here's the CPAP use in the hours, and you can see the best line of fit right here. So about four hours into uh, the CPAP use, you begin to see the discrimination. And this is consistent oh, throughout the uh, different times and uh, blood pressure management. And the longer the person uses the CPAP, the size of the effect uh, increases. So there is clear establishment of the uh, the uh, intervention and the uh, effect. So uh, this is what this trial showed, um, and uh, the mean change was not that high, modest uh, for uh, somebody who is just not paying attention to uh, the cardiovascular system as the cardiologists do. So you think about the microvascular physiology, you know that uh, their heart is beating 80 times a minute and how this translates into their cardiac work index or uh, when the heart has to continuously uh, push against this pressure. So even a millimeter of pressure can translate into significant reduction in the cardiac work index. So that was the uh, standard, really big, long trial that they had. And then came the uh, RUSAS randomized control trial in uh, 2018. Uh, it was randomized, uh, single blind study, sham CPAP for three months, followed by active CPAP, the real CPAP for six months, and the controls were uh, active CPAP for six months. And they uh, compared between the groups uh, those who had res uh, resistant hypertension or uh, with or without the obstructive sleep apnea. And they looked at some of the metabolic uh, uh, parameters, so leptin levels, and uh, this has a, a science of its own, um, and uh, some other uh, metabolic parameters, and so on. Our interest was to look at the blood pressure, and they noticed that the active CPAP uh, in these groups uh, decrease nighttime blood pressure and heart rate in patients with uh, uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And there was no difference between CPAP and sham CPAP for the metabolic and sympathetic nerve, uh, uh, sympathetic system markers. So clearly, uh, at least two trials uh, over a span of five years were able to uh, demonstrate the effect of the CPAP. I apologize for the busyness of this slide from the RUSAS trial, but uh, the only thing that I would like to bring it to your attention is the nighttime blood pressure. Look, look at the uh, degree of improvement, minus 6.3 here, minus 5.9. Uh, that's a significant uh, improvement in the blood pressure. So after the uh, HIPARCO trial, multiple studies uh, came out and this is one of those very well done trial that uh, people continue to study um, the results and the analysis of these trials for subsequent many years and recently in um, uh, in hi hypertension general of hypertension um, editorial showed up and uh, they of course, uh, again, validated the trial by saying this is the largest randomized control long-term longitudinal study, uh, which has significant, uh, which showed the significant benefit of the CPAP treatment and resistant and the refractory hypertension. And then they said they, which subsets of the patients actually get benefited? People who use CPAP, 
for the recommended period of time. Uh, if they had more severe sleep apnea, uh, they will get the more benefit. Uh, if they have uh, daytime and nighttime, the nighttime blood pressure uh, gets affected a lot more, probably coincident with the increased parasympathetic tone. Um, and people who had greater nocturnal desaturation, which will probably translate into worse form of obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and then in more difficult to control form, so people are on different medications, lifestyle modification, and is still not able to uh, get their blood pressure under control, they will probably be benefited by the CPAP therapy. So in this metal analysis of 10 studies, uh, they showed that the difference in the blood pressure reduction is between 4 to 5 millimeters of mercury, which is again a significant finding. Um, they went over and um, analyzed it uh, in many different ways. So uh, the general population of 50% of the population probably has um, uh, high blood pressure. Uh, the if they are hypertensive, they have uh, about evidence of general population evidence of, I want to say, obstructive sleep apnea in 40%, 30, 40% patients. Uh, same thing here. Resistant hypertension about 8% and uh, refractory hypertension about 1% in general population. But with the OSA, 90% association between the OSA and refractory hypertension, 70% with resistant hypertension, just hypertensive patients, they demonstrate the bilateral relationship here with the general population and the with and without the obstructive sleep apnea. And uh, in normal tensive people, uh, that is the uh, typical prevalence of the obstructive sleep apnea in general population. However, having said that, the CPAP effect, if you look at on 24-hour systolic and diastolic blood pressure, not much effect if they are normal tensive. But as the blood pressure rises along these definitions here, you can see that the decrease in the uh, blood pressure is more and more all the way to the tune of 9 millimeters mercury and 7.3 centimeters or 3 millimeters of mercury in systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Now, do we have clinical evidence? Well, we reviewed these two trials and uh, it seems that there is a good signal, two good quality trials, but there is, is still room for improvement and many more trials to come. The cardiovascular risk of uh, cerebrovascular accidents and coronary artery events also uh, continues to improve with the CPAP use, uh, depending on which category we are looking at. So uh, clearly there is the maximum benefit somebody can draw out of these uh, two categories. Having said that, uh, the person, the patient, is still has to um, make the lifestyle changes. Uh, and uh, then at least in these two cases, resistant and refractory hypertension, the antihypertensive medications has to be uh, concomitantly used, and CPAP is not the only answer to this problem. Um, so here is uh, this uh, meta-analysis that we were talking about, and uh, they looked at 10 randomized controlled trials, total of 606 uh, subjects, and again, we'll just go over the highlights. 24-hour systolic pressure, minus 5 reduction, um, then 24-hour diastolic minus 4.2 reduction and nighttime systolic 4.1. So these are definitely the highlights. They were also looking at some of the other parameters and did not find any uh, change. So we can summarize this that uh, obstructive sleep apnea is a major secondary cause of resistant and refractory hypertension. We know that the epidemic or the pandemic of obstructive sleep apnea is rising because of the modern society lifestyle. We have a pandemic of obesity around the world with that weight gain obstructive sleep apnea is uh, rising and clearly it has significant impact on the prevalence of the resistant and refractory hypertension. They both contribute to morbidity and mortality as we know. Uh, basic screening uh, can be easily done in the office and the diagnostic and therapeutic resources uh, definitely are available, sometimes not available in the smaller communities, but definitely nearby uh, larger communities and academic centers, uh, you can find that. 
Um, there are randomized control trials which have evidence um, for the benefit of the CPAP therapy, but more work needs to be done. Of course, we need the lifestyle modifications and supportive measures as well as the medications to continue. And uh, most guidelines now have included uh, the screening and assessment uh, for the obstructive sleep apnea in patients who have uncontrolled hypertension, resistant hypertension, and the refractory hypertension. With that, I would like to thank you again so much for listening to me patiently and have a wonderful rest of the conference. Again, thank you so much and I'll talk to you later. Bye. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Neha Sharma. Consultant Physician at Cardiodiagnostics Clinic and a Psychosocial Counselor working in Ahmedabad and Visiting Consultant to Saal and Sanjeevni Hospitals. Today, I would like to highlight a case of a 38-year-old female who had COVID-19. <clears throat> Six months back, she presented with exertional palpitations, recorded as sinus tachycardia, sense of worthlessness and fatigue. So now I have been asked to approach and manage the patient. So. She was a totally non-diabetic patient, non-hypertensive, non, non low past history of any significant disease or of any operative procedure. I asked her family history and she was a well-settled homemaker and a mother of two kids with a happy family life. On investigations, she had no anemia, her thyroid functions were normal and rest of her blood profile was absolutely normal. ECG depicted sinus tachycardia, so we did 2D echo just to rule out the cause of palpitation and tachycardia, like a valvular problem, which is causing. And so we found out that her echo was also totally normal. Patterns, history of any medications, history of previous emotional traumas, and came to the conclusion that she was suffering from depression coexisting with anxiety disorders post-COVID. So hi, friends. Today, I'm definitely going to discuss about the mental health during COVID conditions. And this is because I want to emphasize on a very important yet neglected topic, because <clears throat> while everyone's attention is more on the statistical data covering symptom severity, diagnostic modality, and morbidity and mortality outcomes of the COVID-19 disease itself, the actual morbidity worldwide, which escalated since the last two years, is the impact of all the panic and uncertainty that this disease has caused everywhere. So here we are, we can, I'm just going to show the next slide. Here we can roughly see the distribution pattern worldwide of COVID cases with majority of cases that were found in US, India, UK, France, and Russia. And the rest of the European countries too added to the already existing increasing amounts of cases worldwide. In this slide, <clears throat> this is a slide of India. Here is graphical representation of comparison of mortality cases during the second wave, which happened in April 21, and the third wave, which happened in January 22 this year in India, has been compared. So as you can see in the first graph, there is a steep rise in the death or mortality rates that was in last year when the second wave due to Delta COVID virus was there. You can see a steep rise in death at the end of the month of April, and there were at least 3,86,000 452 new cases, 3,059 deaths, and 31,70,228 active cases during the April month. At this time, the fully vaccinated people were only 2%. While you can see in the second graph, there is a stability in that rate, that is not much of death rate is there, and there is no vaccine varying pattern too. And neither there was any steep rise in deaths, like in the first graph. So at this time, in this at this January 2022, there were <clears throat> 3,17,532 lakh new cases. Deaths were lower in comparison to the second COVID wave. So deaths were 380 deaths, while the active cases were 19 lakh 24,051. And at this time, there was 72 percent of proportion of fully vaccinated people, much much higher than last year's. This depicts that prompt vaccine manufacture and supply to health centers and with the help of healthcare workers, we were able to give passive immunity to a significant proportion of population and hence could not only control the mortality, but also the associated morbidity. So the global trends of psychological disorders during COVID were that as per the uh, 48 studies done in 204 countries, these depicted depression and anxiety as the major disorders. With such a pandemic in such a technologically advanced times that we are in, 
people were just not ready to deal with such stigmas arising associated with the disease. This led to a surge in mental health disorders amongst general population, and it worsened in those who were already previously mentally unhealthy. So as you can see, these studies, which uh, was done in 204 countries, it included Asia, Australia, America, and Central Europe. Women were found to be affected more in comparison to male counterparts. In adjusted regression models, age, sex, and comorbid pre-pandemic symptoms were significantly associated with depression and anxiety. There was an estimated increase of 53.2 million cases of depression, 27.6% increases from the pre-pandemic era and 76.2 million of increased cases of anxiety that was around 25.6% increases from the pre-pandemic era. So as we can see here that the depression and anxiety superseded all sorts of varieties of mental health disorders in the COVID era. As you can see in the slide of the during late June last year, that is 2021, 40% of US adults reported, <clears throat> reported struggling with mental health and substance abuse. Here, you can see that anxiety and depression symptoms alone were comprised of 31% of population. The trauma and stress-related disorder symptoms comprised of 26%. The people who started taking substances or there was an increase in substance abuse that comprised of 13%. And there was a disturbing 11% of seriously people considering suicide, which was not a good thing to think of. And this parameter could definitely not be neglected. Now, why reasons why pandemic is affecting us, as we can see, as the first COVID wave struck, there was massive anxiety, fear, feeling of doom and depression among public because all of us were facing an unknown virus, which was just killing people with no studies about it and no treatment was available then. This uncertainty of life just made people feel so insecure about themselves and the people around them. There was an increasing sense of loneliness because for majority, the social, social distancing was a sudden new norm, which had to be followed for an unlimited time period then. This raised anxiety levels of mankind, which is supposed to be of social nature. This problem compounded for those young people who were already leading lonely lives and they socialized on so weekends or festivals. For lonely and aged people who were dealing with chronic health conditions, this social distancing just led to the insecurity and depression. Then there was increase in domestic violence. While so many cases of domestic violence were re regularly reported in an increasing manner from countries like China, Spain, Italy, Germany, and Brazil, it was not surprising cause now people had to spend more time at home with abusive partners, unemployment and financial stresses caused conflicts, and police were discouraged from making arrests for such cases during pandemic due to social distancing. Then very importantly, there was loss of jobs and economical setbacks. The pandemic brought a wrath on daily wages workers, low income groups and low to medium businesses. This led to the shutdown of various factories and work there came to a standstill. Due to social distancing, people stopped taking help from the maid servants and started managing household duties themselves. Till work from home strategy was applied, people from IT sector also were just clueless as to how to earn for a living. So there was a lot, loss, lot of uncertainty at that times. Then there was loss of loved ones. Both first and second waves led to a lot of mortality and people lost so many near and dear ones and could not attend to the last rites due to the fear of getting infected. This further added up to the already infected mental trauma and stress that the pandemic had caused. The future uncertainty with close down of so many low to medium strata businesses, which were a lifeline to so many people around, an uncertain future financially and the fear of an uncertain death led to the surge of depression cases. Now that for the disadvantaged groups, they were especially those people who were physically handicapped or mentally challenged, they found the pandemic to be the biggest challenge for the very survival. So, Apart from all this, thankfully, the active role of doctors, nurses, and paramedics, and other healthcare workers, the delivery of duty in daily needs, that is the food and water at door through online usage, the ability to keep in touch with each other through the use of social media, were the breathers that help people to sustain themselves in this journey of pandemic in all the three waves. Now, I discuss a very important topic that is the topic of effect of COVID in child psychology. 
why i like to like to include this topic does because the this is a category the kids which are supposed to be so young and immature but it was so silent and maturely they behave throughout the epidemic they made no less of any hue and cry about the situation they were the most neglected category during the pandemic in terms of mental health conditions because we hardly think that a child can never get depressed anxious don't we because we think that they are at a very tender age which is much <clears throat> much beyond the complication of mental health disorders but that's not the case as you can see in the slide the kids of 5 to 11 years of age such a young age they were also seeking mental health advices rate had increased by 24% in comparison to pre pandemic era for those at the 15 to 17 years of age that is the teenage years rate increased by 31% worldwide in comparison to pre pandemic era so why the depression and anxiety in kids of course because they were suddenly stopped from playing outside with their friends their schools were totally shut down for an unlimited period of time they were home bound totally and they were definitely feeling the vibes of stress among the family members now how do you diagnose how do you see as a parent ke bhai my child is having a psychological problem so what you'll see is you'll see that your kid is getting withdrawal from friends and family he is no more no no uh, he is totally disinterested in his hobbies which he previously pursued there will be prolonged sadness and anger in the child or he may be just excessively sleeping unnecessarily there may be abrupt appetite changes he may be too hungry or he may just not be eating at all or there may be extreme self self judgment the child may think maybe in depression so the role of parents in dealing with child psychology is that you should do a habit of daily check in now what do you do in that that you get in touch with the child and trying to understand his or her body language daily it is so important even if the kid looks chirpy and is playing all the time because a concealed anxiety or depression cannot be just so easily listen and validate the kid's feelings listening to whatever the child has to say should be done very carefully and with empathy and should not be ignored kids can be very sensitive and timid while they express their feelings so it is so important to make them feel valued and understood then you should help kids focus on what they can control that is you should make them understand that the pandemic will not last forever life will get normal schools will reopen and they will able be to get back to in touch with their friends to play and interact and this will be a reality soon and it's so important to be said that to the kids and that they need not fear whatever is happening and what they can't control then you should laugh and play with them and get their friends in touch with them online this is a very important point now if above factors don't help you are trying it all but still it's no of no help then you should help ask a help from a child psychiatrist because maybe the situation is just going out of control and you need your kid back Oh. now this is this topic covers effect of covid-19 on pregnant women now before going to this slide i would like to just stress certain points about the condition of women during the pandemic so what happened was that this in this pandemic of covid women were there who suffered the most because emotionally because be it for a housewife whose household household duties double because every member of the family was there 24 hours at home and the homemaker's duties she had to attend to everyone all the time and this had become very exhausting it was a challenge for a working woman too as attending to her job in a work in the working hours from home and as well as doing the homebound duties as well all simultaneously and it was a compulsion at home to be there so without he the help of any maid or servant so it was very tough for the women in either ways be it a housewife or a working woman and all this led to a rise in stress depression and anxiety in all categories of women significantly women facing domestic violence in these times showed increased post traumatic stress disorder and depression now out of all this discussion we cannot leave out female healthcare workers too who suffered from a lot of stress depression anxiety insomnia due to dealing with covid patients all the time and staying away with, with <clears throat> from their families for weeks together and risk of getting infected with covid virus and the uncertainty of life henceforth various studies carried out carried out in china usa uk europe as well as india depicted how female health workers were managing both fronts that is job and household and how pandemic was affecting their mental health so far as you can see in the slide there for pregnant women 
there are 11,432 pregnant women attending or admitted to hospital, which included from 77 studies. Out of 74% of pregnant women with COVID-19 presented asymptomatically. And pregnant women are less likely to present with a cough, sore throat, and fatigue compared to other non-pregnant women. Then pregnant women with COVID-19 are more likely to be admitted in intensive care without with the required invasive ventilation compared to the pregnant women without COVID-19. Plus those women who had hypertension, diabetes, and other risk factors, they were more risk of the severity of COVID infection. So as far as the studies go, there are various studies where were one, they were done on pregnant women, but they had conflicting data. Since pregnancy in itself is a pro-thrombotic state, hence for COVID positive patient, there were higher chances of getting admitted to hospital, higher rate of miscarriages, preterm births, preeclampsia, and perinatal deaths. It was found safer to keep COVID positive mother in isolation away from her child for the determined period to COVID cross infection. COVID positive mother can breastfeed or not is also controversial. All these situations had to further be, they led to further increase of stress and depression rate rise in pregnant female patients. So what are the important considerations in this situation? First is make mental health issues a priority as any other disease commonly is prevalent in society that, that ways. Try to deal with the stigmatization of mental health disorders in society. Then teleconsultation or psychiatric help for the patient was a mandatory thing to be done. Psychology of children and pregnant women should not be ignored. And you can't ignore the mental health issues of medical personnel too, as a part of a caregiver burnout. So as far as a study done in uh, 34 hospitals in China, I'll come to that later. First, I'll just tell you about the management studies to help people deal with stress. <laughs> Now, how to manage it? First is get enough sleep. Then participate in physical activities, home, home. Eat a healthy diet with a lot of fresh fruits and veggies with increased content of vitamin C and vitamin D. Avoid tobacco, alcohol, and drugs. Limit your screen time. Spend more time with family than on gadgets. Relax and recharge. Limit media feedback and news channel viewing because media is all about negativity. It's all about getting negative news. So you should avoid negative uh, view and feedbacks. Keep a regular routine. Do deep breathing exercises. Set priorities and reasonable goals. And if all the above things are not happening, definitely to, you should take a mental health counselor or a psychiatrist help. Just very important. Now, in this slide, I can show you, I'll be covering now the mental health workers because mental health conditions of public health workers. This was a, this is a statistical data in the, done in the month of March, April, 2021. Amongst the 26,174 survey responses, they showed that 53% report, person reported symptoms of at least one mental health condition in the previous two weeks. 32% reported symptoms of depression. 30% reported symptoms of anxiety and 37% reported symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, and so on. Now, how can we support PHW's mental health, that is, primary health workers' mental health? What we can do is, we destigmatize de requests for mental health assistance. We address work practices that contribute to stress and trauma. We build awareness of symptoms of mental health conditions, and we develop sustainable coping strategies. We make employee assistance programs accessible and acceptable. What we can do is in two levels. First is the organizational level and second is the individual level. So what do we do in the organization level? We can do is we can explore best practices and measures for staff support, such as what we can we do? We can give them reasonable workload, not too much of workload, not less of it. There can be a recognition of the achievements, that is whatever health worker they have done, the whatever practices they have achieved, it should be acknowledged. They should get a uh, much required time off when and when required. There should be access to mental well-being resources like community forums and employee assistance programs. There should be telephone and internet counseling and intervention programs. There should be availability of healthy meals between duty shifts, which is very important then there should be a provision of adequate supplies of high quality PPE kits. So this is very important at the organization level for all sorts of healthcare workers in all over the world. 
Now, what on the individual level basis? We can do is explore positive coping mechanisms and stress management, such as we can get a, the person, the mental health worker can get a support from families, friends, or co-workers. They can help and get into meditation exercises. They can go for natural exercises and deep uh, breathing exercises and natural therapy. So <clears throat> then they should get an opportunity to attend to personal and family needs. So dear colleagues, I now end up my session wishing and hoping that this pandemic comes to an end like all of us are hoping and we can all start leading a healthy and normal life as the pre-COVID times. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Hello everyone. I am Dr. Gaurav. I am an assistant professor in the Department of uh, Cardiology at uh, UN Mecca Hospital. Uh, today we are going to discuss an important aspect in uh, intervention cardiology that is uh, ISR, that is instant restenosis after implantation of drug eluting stent. Uh, here we have a case, uh, a 45 year old uh, uh, gentleman present presents with uh, instant restenosis in LED stent after five years of uh, drug eluting stent implantation with typical anginal chest pain uh, despite optimal medical therapy. Uh, so our discussion point would be, uh, what would be our approach? in this case. So as you all know, uh, instant restenosis or ISR is basically uh, defined as gradual re-narrowing uh, that is more than 50% of a stented coronary artery segment or its edge that is 5M segment adjacent to the stent. And we have a classification that is Mehran system is a morphological basically a morphological classification and it was originally created for the BMS ISR, but it has some prognostic value in terms of uh, repeat revascularization in uh, drug eluting stent ISR also. So, what would you uh, do first in this case? So, as you see, the 45 year old male and uh, he had undergone angioplasty five years back with a drug eluting stent. The first step would be to image first. Uh, either with the help of IVAS or OCT to identify what is the cause of ISR, what is the mechanism of ISR that is the uh, uh, great important in the management of this case. So image first. So IVAS can detect what is the problem with our stand, whether it is under expanded or there is a new interval hypoplasia or there is a edge restenosis or there is a stud fracture. OCT due to its superior axial re resolution provides better image of vessel lumen interface, new intimal tissue and stud distribution. So OCT is slightly better than uh, IVAS for uh, ISR evaluation. So what, what, uh, what would be the treatment option? So once we have imaged the vessel, uh, then what are the treatment options? The first option is uh, Popa, age, uh, age old popa that is plain old uh, balloon angioplasty uh, with or without cutting or scoring balloon. Uh, this, this is a age old method works well in if the vessel, uh, if the ISR stand is under expanded. Otherwise, the problem with popa is that uh, there are higher chances of restenosis and the even the early lum uh, lumen loss area is also. Uh, grade with uh, POBA. So the good thing about POBA is a technically simple procedure, uh, but the bad thing about it, uh, higher chances of uh, recurrent or, or repeat revascularization. What is the second option? Placement of another test containing different drug. So if we have an ISR in a PMS stand, that is a non-drug eluting stand, this is the first option. You place a stand, which is a drug eluting stand, but here we are dealing with the ISR in a desk. So uh, placement of another dress, uh, preferably with a different drug, and that is uh, termed as a hetero drug approach. The logical explanation for this is uh, a different drug, a different polymer will help to prevent another ISR. So uh, another upcoming treatment modality is a DCB, that is a drug coated balloon. It is very effective in treatment of both BMS and DES ISR. Uh, and it does not add uh, additional layer of uh, metal. 
and uh, technically simple. Uh, so DCB is an upcoming treatment modality for the DES ISR. And uh, in selected cases where uh, a placement of another uh, DES is not possible or drug floating, drug coated balloon is not possible, then CABG is a viable alternative option. So we have four options for management of this case. The preferred one is placement of another test containing different drug or DCB and CABG in selected cases. So the take home message from my side is uh, that treatment of uh, DES ISR is very challenging and uh, second generation DES uh, or drug coated balloon are best and more than two metal stents in a repeated ISR lesion is likely to have a detrimental effect on long term outcomes and uh, we should not uh, go for uh, <coughs> another metal layer in such cases and uh, CBG in selected cases would box wonders. Mm -hmm. uh, more studies and newer treatment options are needed for adult treatment of uh, DES ISR. Oh, thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, today I am going to take a brief introduction of what is ethics in medical research and what, as a basic, we have to follow the ethics in our medical research. <laughs> now, the ethic in medical research, there is a recent national ethical guideline for biomedical and health research, which is published by ICMR. It's available in the website of the ICMR. And I think if any person is going to do any medical ethics, he should read this document fully. Now, why this ethics is important? Because in the past, it was many dark stories. In 1963 to 66, Willowbrook study, in which in mentally disabled child, they have seen the natural progression of the uh, liver disease by injecting hepatitis virus. There's a lot of hue and cries for these studies. Then the thalidomide tragedy, we all know that this drug which was studied has led to about 5,000 to 7,000 infants were born with phacomelia. Then come 1963, Jewish chronic disease hospital study in which uh, the purpose of this research was to determine how a weakened immune system influenced the spread of cancer. And this, in this study, there's no ethical approval, no consent form, patients were not informed and the researchers found guilty of fraud, decoyed and unprofessional conduct. Then there's a syphilis study in which about 300 mostly indigenous African American who are untreated. They have seen a natural history of syphilis and they are untreated many, many years after penicillin was known to cure syphilis. So in 1964, there's a declaration of Helensky in June 1964. And this is very, very important. It is a set of ethical principle regarding human experiment. And the most important thing, subject must be informed of aims, methods, anticipated benefit, potential hazard, freely given consent must be obtained, preferably in writing. In 1978, the Belmont report, report created by the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Research, which says the respect of person, beneficence, and justice to be given to all the participants. Then come ICH introduction in 1990, which is known as International Conference on Hormonization of Technical Requirement for Registration of Pharmaceutical for Drug Use. What are the types of research? This basically, the research may be a basic research, which I know the preclinical research, which include animal experiments, cell studies, biochemical, genetic, and physiological investigations. The clinical study, performed on man to study the clinical or pharmacological effect of any drug or device or treatment. <laughs> it may be two types of studies, an academic research, which is uh, sponsored by an institution. It may be interventional, non-interventional, -inter and it may be clinical research sponsored by pharma. Clinical trial, any investigation in human subject intend to identify adverse reaction to investigation product, clinical and formal pharmacological effect, and to study absorption, distribution, and metabolism of IP is a clinical trial. 
And there's a different type of clinical trial depending, depending on what the researchers are studying, like treatment research, prevention research, diagnostic research, screening research, in which there's a quality of life research, genetic studies, epidemiological studies. So these are very different type of clinical research which, as a, which a person is going to conduct. You should also know a very few minutes of drug development and clinical trial phases. Now, drug development have a lot of milestones in that. Preclinical drug development, identify for drug target, drug screening, small scale production, then laboratory and animal testing, production for clinical trial, and then they file for various approvals. The drug development, there's basically a four phase, a preclinical, clinical trial, phase one, two, three, and phase four, which average takes about 10 to 15 years. And uh, usually the phase one is mainly for safety of drugs. Phase two is short-term safety and efficacy, maybe placebo control and with multiple doses. And phase three is basically long-term safety of doses, effectiveness of that drugs. So usually the, the time interval from the phase one to phase three trial is approximately seven to 10 years. There's two important uh, authority are DCGI and ICMR. We should always know. The DCGI is a drug control journal of India. All pharmaceutical company sponsored clinical trial in India must be registered with DCGI. When, the, when is ICMR approval required? Any application for academic or industry research project involving foreign assistance and stem cell therapy and our collaboration in biomedical health research are to be submitted by the Indian investigation to ICMR for approval of government of India through HMSE. So any, if you have any foreign collaboration, if you have any investigation product going to the um, foreign country, like your investigation, then it has to be, the approval from HMSE needs to be taken. The collaborative research, you should also know what is an ethical issue surrounding a collaborative research. They are the point, how you are sharing the data, technology, what the ownership of material, data, IPR, joint publication, managing research finding, management and commercialization of research outcome. So this all issue need to be taken ethically when you are collaborating a research with other institution, inter-department, inter-institution, inter-country. Uh, with the progress in the era of cellular and molecular biology, the following points are important. Safety during transfer, that is very, very important. You are transferring a biological material. The safety need to be ensured. National security need to be ensured. People cannot make a biological weapon. So, weapon, so a national security risk from the defense and internal security point of view of the country, IPR, potential for commercial exploitation, I uh, institute ethic committee clearance to be submitted for each of the participant center site at the time of submission of proposal to ICMR. Project will be rejected by HMS in the absence of institute ethic committee certification. So that is very, very important when you are doing a uh, project on cellular and molecular biology. These are various type of risk assessment during uh, research, like less than minimal risk, what is Probability of harm or discomfort anticipated in the research is nil or not expected. Minimal risk, low risk, and high risk, like probability of harm or discomfort anticipated in the research is invasive and greater than minimal risk. So this is a type of risk determination during a study or conducting a study. You have to have ethical committee because all the ethical and the research proposal need to be passed by your ethical committee, whether it's a retrospective study, it's a data collection, even, even, even if you are doing some uh, two or three case reports, it has to be approved by the, your institutional ethic committee. So reviewing and uh, what is the role of the committee, design of the trial, suitability of the investigator, suitability of the facility, method and material, Favorable risk benefit assessment. The primary purpose of such review is to assure the protection of the human subject. These are the various members which is 
designated by ICMR and you can go to ICMR website, find out how your ethic committee should be formed. You should have a chairperson, vice chairperson, member secretary, basic research scientist, clinician, legal experts, social scientists, lay person, all are important for constitution of ethic committee. The ethic committee should be multidisciplinary, competent and independent in its functioning with the chairperson and 50% members as non-affiliated means your chairperson and 50% of members should not be from your institution. And these are various guidelines, how to form the quorum, how to take decision, uh, 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 issue should form a subcommittee for SAE, SAE means side effect assessment uh, subcommittee or anything. So these are the various norms, SOP of the Ethic Committee, which is given in ICMR website. Now, gender issues. That is how the gender issues. When you are doing a research, these are the gender issues. All research involving human participants should be conducted in accordance with the basic and gender ethical principles. And what are the various principles? First, the principle of essentiality, whereby after due consideration of all alternative in the right of existing knowledge, the use of human participant is considered to be essential for the proposed research. This should be duly vetted by an ethic committee. Principle of voluntariness. You cannot force anybody to participate in the study. Principle of non-exploitation, whereby research participants are equitably selected so that the benefit and burden of the research are distributed fairly and without arbitrariness or discrimination. Principle of social responsibility. That is very, very important. Principle of ensuring privacy and confidentiality. This is the most important thing that whereby to maintain privacy of the potential participant. That is very, very important. You cannot disclose the name of party participants during your research. Then principle of risk minimization. When you are doing your research, you have to minimize the risk. That is the utmost important principle of professional competence, whereby the research is planned, conducted, evaluated, and monitored throughout by a person who are competent to have uh, to do this research. Principle of maximization of benefit and principle of institutional arrangement. These all need to be followed when you are conducting a research. Then principle of transparency and accountability whereby the research plan and outcome from the research are brought into the public domain through registries, reports, and scientific and other publication. Principle of totality of responsibility, whereby the stakeholders involved in research are responsible for their action. This is very, very important. And 12, principle of environmental protection, whereby research are accountable for ensuring protection of the environment and resource at all stage of the research in compliance with the existing guidelines and regulation. So, so what is other gender ethical issues? Benefit risk assessment. That is very, very important. Benefit to the individual, community or society referred to any sort of favorable outcome of the research. The researcher, sponsors and EC should attempt to minimize, maximize benefit and minimize risks. And the C is informed consent process. That is very, very important. So the informed consent process need to have this all requirement. The informed consent document, which include patient information sheet and informed consent form, both should be incorporated and element informed consent document should all be written in this informed consent document. For our biomedical and health research involving human participants, in the principal responsibility of the researcher to obtain the written informed consent of the pro uh, prospective participant or legally acceptable authorized person. In case of any an individual who is not capable of giving informed consent, the consent of the LRA should be obtained. So consent is very, very important. Now, uh, recently from 2013, in certain circumstances, audio visual recording of the informed consent process may be required. For example, in certain clinical drug trials. So in that, you have to take a full audio video consent form, which is being, the how to take it is being given in your ICMR website. These are the various conditions in which you can grant waiver of consent from the ethic committee. But this has to be given by ethic committee. You have to apply that because I'm doing a retrospective study, there's no prospective study. I'm just doing a data analysis, so the consent may be waived. So you have to apply to ethic committee and it is only the right of ethic committee to waive the consent uh, for the study. 
the privacy and confidentiality need to be maintained at all level of your research so if you are going to go research kindly read these documents how to uh, maintain privacy and confidentiality distribution justice payment for participant yes you cannot direct bribe the participant so there is a certain applicable principle for reimbursement for expense incurring in travel incurring in loss of wages and food supply that you can provide to the patient but you cannot bribe or give any incentive for these patients compensation that is very very important so the compensation for research related harm is very very important need to be mentioned in your informed consent document we need to be vetted by your ethic committee and it is the responsibility of the host institute to provide compensation and how to calculate compensation in adverse effect and you have to report all adverse event it is it is generally written in that document which adverse event to be reported to ethic committee in which time then which adverse event to be uh, reported to the dcgi it's all given your uh, uh, in your that document so you have to have known how to report adverse event there may be an adverse event there may be a serious event uh, adverse event a serious uh, adverse event is when you die the life threatening or cardiac arrest in patient hospitalization so all hospitalization is basically an sae so compensation in case of injury you have to provide free medical management financial compensation in case of death there is a compensation form, formula which is given you have to calculate and you have to provide compensation so the compensation to be provided in all drug trial trial in which you are randomizing the patient uh, and these are the various formula which is being provided conflict of interest is very very important so all members has to disclose their conflict of interest when they are uh, doing a research selection of vulnerable and special group as research participants so there are various vulnerable population like economical and social disadvantage the pregnant woman is well vulnerable the child is vulnerable the old age is vulnerable refugees so these are all a list of vulnerable patient uh, this is very important post research assess and benefit sharing the benefit occurring from research should be made as uh, accessible to individuals communities and population whenever it is relevant Uh, this is a criteria of authorship it is given in uh, international committee for medical journal editors icmj they have clear cut given that well, how should be the authorship be labeled in uh, any uh, uh, research now these are very important what are the type of research misconduct fabrication in the international act of making up data falsification in manipulating research material plagiarism this all are misconduct and misconduct is now taken as a very serious thing in doing a medical research the for stem cell proposal should be reviewed and approved by an institutional committee for stem cell independent ec that function outside institution can be used by researcher who have no institutional ethic committee so these are the new amendment in this uh, like the constitution of ethic committee that they have make a minimum of seven member and one woman member is mandatory that is the older one and the left is a newer one which is given in that gazette notification the uh, important thing is uh, what i am saying that if uh, you have taken an approval for a research and you have not recruited any patient for one year then you have to take again re approval from the ethic committee and after every two years you have to take approval from the ethic committee if you are doing a drug trial now these are various condition for permission of clinical research six monthly status report to be published and what i have said that uh, if one year has passed you have to again take uh, approval from the ethic committee <coughs> that is very very important post trial assess of investigation new drug or new drug if you think that this drug is being essential for the patient only uh, available uh, drugs then you the thick committee can ask the sponsors to provide this drug free of cost lifetime to the participant that is very very important and what is an academic trial the academic clinical trial means a trial of a drug already approved for a certain claim and initiated by 
any investigator, academics or research institution for a new indication or new route of administration or new dose or new drug form where the result of such trial are intended to be used only for academic purpose nor commercial purpose. So no permission uh, from the higher authority need to be taken. However, all this trial to be approved by ethic committee. That is very, very important. And the... Uh, uh, Whereas compensation, that is very, very important. The, the compensation for academic trial can be waived off. However, this need to be individualized and need to be approved by the ethic committee. But this is very important. Ethical principle, including compensation, medical management in case of injury or death are applicable for academic clinical trials. So you cannot say that in academic clinical trial, these are all not included. They are all included in certain academic trial if you want to um, exempt certain thing, it has to be, you have to take permission of the ethic committee. The good document practice, clinical documentation should be recorded and organized as being provided in this gadget notification. That is very, very important. So all the documents, practically we say that the ethic committee document need to be uh, stored for at least five years. So thank you for a kind hearing and uh, what I can say that doing medical research is uh, at present has lot of uh, lot of restrictions lot of ethical views lot of legality so kindly go and read the document completely if you are going to do a medical research thank you very much for your kind i am dr kevar kanabar i am an assistant professor in the department of cardiology at un medha institute of cardiology and research center and i'll be discussing the approach to a patient of refractory heart failure so uh, the case that I will discuss is a 45-year-old young male patient, known case of DCM or dilated cardiomyopathy, known since the last five years on medical treatment. He has recently been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes mellitus. He has had two episodes of heart failure hospitalization in the last six months. His background medical treatment includes uh, usual dose of diuretic that is torsemide 10 mg twice a day, 25 mg of spironolactone once a day, uh, Sacubetril valsartan 50 mg twice a day and metoprolol 50 mg once a day. Now, this patient is somebody who has known DCM. Now, the patients who come to tertiary care centers are being labeled as DCM when they are found to have a systolic dysfunction in the absence of any cause. But some of these patients can have a different diagnosis. Some of these patients can have ischemic cardiomyopathy. Some of them can have infiltrative diseases like sarcoidosis. So, uh, just a plain label of dilated cardiomyopathy is not enough. In a study that was conducted recently, uh, which included approximately 1,200 patients, they showed that in patients who were labeled as idiopathic DCM, only 50% were found to have idiopathic DCM. Approximately 10 to 15% had, had ischemic cardiomyopathy, and the remaining 30 to 40% had miscellaneous causes of cardiomyopathy, like post myocarditis, post cancer chemotherapies, post. Uh, viral infections. So it is important to know the cause of LV dysfunction because that is going to guide the treatment and the management. So when a patient who comes to me with a label of DCM, the things that I want to look are what is the patient's clinical status? What is his baseline clinical status? Remember this patient has had two episodes of heart failure hospitalization or acute decompensated heart failure. Now the cause of acute decompensated heart failure in a known case of DCM can be plenty and I'll discuss those also in detail. But what I want to look at is the baseline clinical status of the patient. What is the patient's NYHA class? So how symptomatic is the patient on optimal medical treatment when it does not have a heart failure hospitalization? Does the patient have a history of angina? This is very important. Although dilated cardiomyopathy, the idiopathic ones also can have dyspnea, can also have angina. But if angina is a prominent symptom, we should look at two or three important things. One is, does the patient have a valvular disease like aortic stenosis, which may have been missed? Or... Does the patient have something like a coarctation of aorta, which is giving rise to uh, LV dysfunction? And another thing is very important, you should always rule out coronary artery disease, right? Next, does the patient have history of uh, orthopnea or PND? Uh, what is the patient's exercise tolerance? And very important, does the patient have history of symptomatic palpitations, a history of syncope or history of sudden cardiac death? Uh, another important question I would like to ask is, does the patient have right heart failure symptoms like anorexia, nausea, vomiting, jaundice, abdominal distension, fetal edema? Because if these are present, the prognosis drastically changes. Just left heart failure symptoms are manageable. But once right heart failure start, symptoms start, the disease usually has a downhill course. 
I want to ask the baseline history: Is the patient hypertensive? Does the patient have history of alcohol abuse or binge alcohol consumption? Is there a family history of sudden cardiac death or a family history of cardiomyopathy? Does the patient have a prior history of malignancy for which he received chemotherapy? Did the patient have uh, any history of viral infection preceding the first episode of uh, hospitalization, uh, which may suggest that the patient may have post myocarditis cardiomyopathy? Or does the patient have any systemic symptoms of infiltrative diseases like sarcoidosis or myeloidosis? periorbital purpuras skin lesions arthritis or pulmonary symptoms we all know the nyha classification uh, class 1 is the patient usually is asymptomatic on ordinary physical activity class 2 is symptomatic on ordinary activity class 3 is on less than ordinary activity and class 4 is uh, symptoms at rest now the things that which i want to stress on what is the reason for decompensation remember that dcm is usually a stable disease uh, the downhill course is slow and the average survival in the recent studies usually lasts from 5 to 10 years but why did the patient decompensate one very important point and uh, one of the most important i would say is that the, there may be non compliance so drugs patients usually on medical treatment feel that they are doing much well and that is why they stop all their drugs and drug non compliance is uh, particularly a very important cause of decompensation second is dietary incompliance if the patient is taking too much salt or too much water so i would like to ask for the water intake i would also like to ask for what is the weight what is the serial weight uh, monitoring over the period of last 6 to 12 months uh, infections particularly respiratory tract infections covid they are all known to precipitate uh, dilated cardiomyopathy and can lead to heart failure hospitalizations ischemia another very important cause is what i want to look at very important is arrhythmias particularly atrial fibrillation fast ventricular rate svts vts they all can decompensate a known patient with dcm uh, alcohol use drugs like calcium channel blockers steroids they can all precipitate ccbs and these are what i want to look at for the reason for decompensation reason for dcm as i already discussed i want to look at uh, history of alcohol abuse history of viral myocarditis history of cancer chemotherapy and a history of angina which may suggest that the patient may have associated coronary artery disease on the physical examination a lot of physical examination has been replaced by echocardiogram but what cannot be replaced by an echocardiogram is the basic examination what are the patient's vitals what is the pulse if the patient has sinus tachycardia or pulse alternance this usually suggest an adverse prognosis particularly if the patient has sinus tachycardia it usually means that uh, the disease is far advanced i particularly want to look at the patient's general condition the height weight and the bmi because that would suggest what is the patient's uh, clinical status uh, anorexic patient usually indicates that the patient has advanced chf uh, very important is to stress on uh, cardiac uh, cardiopulmonary examination particularly examination of the respiratory system to look for crepitations or wheeze and signs of systemic congestion in the form of pedal edema hepatomegaly and raised jvp these are things which cannot be given by an echocardiogram an echocardiogram can give you a lot of things but these are the things which we need to examine and we need to assess before we start the patient on any treatment the cardiovascular examination although not very important i would say that looking for murmurs is important but a lot of cardiovascular examination can be supplemented or replaced by an echocardiogram a very important test ecg a baseline ecg and the current ecg is very important because i want to look at certain things what is the heart rate as i already stressed that tachycardia is an adverse prognostic marker i want to look at the rhythm does the patient have atrial fibrillation does the patient have sinus tachycardia does the patient have ventricular ectopics does the patient have ventricular tachycardia all these are important findings of old mi may indicate that this may be an ischemic cardiomyopathy so and also these patients can have right ventral branch block left ventral branch block bifascicular blocks trifascicular blocks what is very important is i want to look at if the patient has left ventral branch block because that would indicate that the patient may be a candidate for a cardiac resynchronization therapy so as i have said that i want to look at arrhythmias i want to look at conduction blocks i want to look at the rate i want to look at the rhythm uh, figure on the left indicates atrial fibrillation with a fast rate and can precipitate dcmp and the figure on the right indicates that the patient has non sustained vt and if the patient has non sustained vt he may be a candidate for an icd or a crtd so these are things i want to look at in the electrocardiogram on the echocardiogram i uh, particularly want to look at the lv dimensions what are the lv dimensions lv dimension higher than 70 usually indicates very advanced disease and indicates an adverse prognosis so i want to assess the lv function by simpson's method i want to look for regional wall motion abnormalities the lv and the la dimensions very important is i want to look at the right side of the heart what is going on in the right side of the heart so what are the rv pressures what is the ra pressure and what is the pa pressure now the workup requires certain blood investigations to be done 
I want to look at the complete blood count. Remember that a hemoglobin of more than 12 is acceptable. A hemoglobin of 10 to 12, if there is iron deficiency, needs to be supplemented with IV iron, like ferric carboxymaltose. So I want to look at the iron studies with ferritin. So I'll do a complete blood count with uh, MCH, MCV, MCHC with iron studies and ferritin. I want to look at the renal functions. Very important because they are going to uh, be a key determining factor in the treatment that we give. So urea, creatinine, sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. I want to look at the thyroid function test, T4 and TSH. A baseline troponin, I or troponin T should be done in all patients. Very important is the role of biomarkers, BNP or NT-proBNP. It should be done in all patients and it should also be used for follow-up. Since the patient is on sacubital valsartan, we cannot use BNP and we need to use NT-proBNP. So I will, in this patient, go for an NT-proBNP. And if the values are more than 500, it usually indicates that the levels are elevated. I'll do a liver function test. Since the patient is diabetic, I'll do an HbA1c, fasting and postprandial blood sugars. I'll do a lipid profile and work up for HIV. Also in this patient, you should always look for pheochromocytoma, especially if the patient has history of hypertension or resistant hypertension. Now, apart from the blood workup, there are certain things which we need, which we can do. So, a cardiac MRI is very helpful because it can give you an idea about any infiltration. It can give you an idea if the patient has underlying sarcoidosis, giant cell myocarditis, if the patient has an old scar, if the patient has ischemic heart disease. So, cardiac MRI should be done in all young patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. MUGA scan, I'll only, under, I'll only advise the patient to undergo if the patient is planned for a cardiac transplant. Otherwise, I won't suggest to undergo a MUGA scan, but cardiac MRI should be done in all young patients with DCM, especially if they have arrhythmias or conduction blocks. Walter, I will advise the patient if the patient has any history of uh, syncope or if there are ectopics on the ECG or if there is conduction block. If there is any uh, suspicion of an arrhythmia, ventricular arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, then I'll advise the patient to undergo a Holter. Coronary angiogram, I'll advise this patient because this patient is diabetic, this patient has DCM. Coronary angio should always be done to rule out underlying ischemic heart disease because we know that a treatment of ischemia either by angioplasty or bypass has the potential to improve the left ventricular function in these patients. Assessment of functional capacity uh, is uh, not frequently done, but I would suggest the patient to undergo assessment of functional capacity at least once. Although cardiopulmonary exercise test or CPET is a gold standard, uh, it is not frequently used and also not frequently available. So a simpler test that we can do is a six minute walk test and it can be used to guide the treatment and also to follow up of these patients. Uh, again, uh, the treatment of the patient is not limited to the patient himself, but also to his siblings and also to his children. So a genetic screening and family screening is important. Genetic screening for DCM is not widely available in our country. So that is something that uh, is something restricted for the future, but family screening with the uh, echocardiogram and an electrocardiogram should be done for all siblings and for all of his children. So the uh, underlying evaluation of this patient focus is basically on history, physical examination, very important blood workup, especially biomarkers like troponin and uh, anti pro -BNP. And always a coronary angiogram and advanced imaging in the form of either cardiac MRI um, and a MUGA. And if required, we can undergo Holter and ex assessment of the cardiopulmonary exercise capacity, either with a cardiopulmonary exercise test or a six minute walk test. That would be all in the evaluation of uh, young DCM who has had two heart failure hospitalizations recently. Thank you. I'm Dr. Karthik Netrajan, Associate Professor of Cardiology, UN Meta Hospital. I'd like to thank CardioCon and Dr. Kamal Sharma sir for this very interesting session of a patient, of a 43 year old patient, a female patient who comes with unprovoked pulmonary embolism within two years. So this is something which we deal with in our day to day practice very commonly. So we'll be discussing the etiology of the same, what will be the investigations that we'll carry out and what should be the management of such patients. So basically, what is pulmonary embolism? And how common is it? So pulmonary embolism is a life-threatening complication of venous thromboembolism. It represents a major post-operative complication. Pulmonary embolism is, is commonly seen in patients with deep vein thrombosis. More than half of these patients are asymptomatic. The mortality remains quite high, 10 to 30% at 90 days, utilizing the current treatment regimes. The incidence seem to, seems to be increasing from 3 to 100, 3 per 100 to more than 6.5 per 100 in the past 15 years, accounts for about 15% of the total post-operative deaths. And the worst part is that 81% of the patients who have pulmonary embolism would not even know or would not even, they would not know how 
it feels to have pulmonary embolism and 50% would have not heard of the term pulmonary embolism. So it's quite possible that the patient who comes to you with the first episode or so-called first episode of pulmonary embolism would have had multiple episodes in the past and would not be aware of it. The basic pathology of pulmonary embolism, at least 90% of the pulmonary emboli, they originate from the major leg veins. The pathogenesis involves the interplay of an acute inflammatory reaction triggered by vascular endothelial lesions, hypercoagulability in venous stasis. The key con factors which contribute to hemodynamic collapse in acute pulmonary embolism is that acute pulmonary embolism, it interferes with both the circulation and the gas exchange. So basically, it is the RV which fails initially. There is an R increase in LV, RV afterload, RV dilatation with an increase in the neurohormonal, neurohormonal activation, RV ischemia, which ultimately results in decreased R RV coronary perfusion, systemic BP, low cardiac output, decreased RV output and RV failure, and ultimately the RV starts failing and the patient collapses. So RV failure is the predominant cause of death or primary cause of death in severe pulmonary embolism. The clinical presentation is varied, you know, it's, it's a diverse and that is one reason why pulmonary embolism is largely remains undetected because it can present as acute onset dyspnea, it can present as acute onset chest pain, presyncope, hemoptysis, any patient who has shortness of breath and or rapid breathing, rapid heart rate, chest pain, sudden onset which may be worse upon deep breath should be suspected as having pulmonary embolism unless proven otherwise. And this slide shows the varied presentations of pulmonary embolism. So once you say diagnose a patient as acute PE, the most important even before diagnosis is risk stratification, whether the patient fits into a high risk category or not high risk category. So depending upon whether the patient is having shock or hypotension, if the patient is in shock, then it would be high risk, a blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury or a systolic blood pressure drop of more than 40 millimeters of mercury for more than 15 minutes if not caused by a new onset arrhythmia, hypovolemia, or sepsis. And if the patient is not in shock and hypotension, you have some time to evaluate and classify the patient as intermediate or low risk. What are the diagnostic investigations in pulmonary embolism? So here is the main difference. Uh, if you come uh, as a diagnosed case of first time pulmonary embolism or recurrent pulmonary embolism, all the patients who are suspected to have PE should have a general medical history taken, a physical examination and a chest x-ray. And then you evaluate according to the Wells or the Geneva score. So the two level Wells score where you classify the patients as either PE likely or unlikely. If the patient is having pulmonary embolism, likely to have pulmonary embolism, offer an immediate CTPA. But if it's not available immediately, you go for interim parental anticoagulation followed by a CTPA. And if the CTPA turns out to be negative, get a uh, ultrasound done if the if DVT is suspected and the pulmonary embolism is unlikely, offer a D-dimer. If the D-dimer is positive, get a CTPA done. And if it's not available, again, go for anticoagulation till you get one done. We are all aware of the well score. I'm not going into the detail of the original and the simplified version, which classifies as PE. Ultimately, the idea is whether PE is likely or unlikely. The revised Geneva score has also been uh, uh, useful in predicting whether the patient has pulmonary embolism or not. Once the patient is, say, having a high risk PE and you cannot or you can go for a CT angio immediately, well and good, get a CT angio done. If this positive, then the patient may require some form of reperfusion therapy. If the CT angio does not show a CTP, obviously it's ruled out, you need to rule out other, other features. If the CT angio is not available, which is very common, or the patient cannot be shifted to the CT scan, then you look at the echo, get, uh, look for signs of RV overload. If the patient is having RV overload, yes. Then you go for a CT when the patient gets stabilized. And then if the CT shows pulmonary embolism, you need to go for primary perfusion. Or if sometimes you cannot go for a CT, you can visualize the pulmonary embolism. Or sometimes you have a very strong clinical hunch, you can go for primary perfusion without the CT also. For not high risk PE, you can have a more you know slow and steady uh, uh, investigative course. Uh, class, uh, if the patient is classified in lower intermediate category or clinical probability, get a D-dimer done. If it's negative, no treatment is required, positive CT angio. And if PE is confirmed in treatment and no PE, no treatment. If there's a high probability of PE, go for a CT angio directly. If the PE is confirmed, go for the treatment. And if there's no PE, no need to investigate further. And I'd like to add that, you know, if a patient is coming with recurrent pulmonary embolism, like in our case, 
once you have stabilized the patient, you have given the treatment, I think the etiology of pulmonary embolism becomes very important. So if I come across a patient who is a female, 43 year old, has come with unprovoked DVT within two years of treatment, then, you know, factors like say APLA, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, uh, going for beta 2 glycoprotein levels, going for lupus anticoagulant, going for an ANA, and uh, going for an anti uh, neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibody, ANCA test, CANCA and PNCA, looking for the hypercoagulability causes like say a protein C, protein S, factor 5 mutation, prothrombin gene mutation, sometimes even methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase mutations, homocysteine levels, all this constitute the etiology of recurrent pulmonary embolism. The reason for investigating these patients such a way is that you need to define the course of anticoagulation. Probably this patient would require a high, high, a high dose anticoagulation or more aggressive anticoagulation of lifetime because the patient has already had a second episode of pulmonary embolism. So once this patient comes with pulmonary embolism and you have the patient as high risk with shock or hypotension, obviously the treatment is primary reperfusion. Now the EAC, EAC classifies the three reperfusion strategies as either you go for systemic thrombolysis, you go for catheter-directed thrombolysis, or you go for surgical embolectomy. If the patient is not having a high risk or there is not high risk P, you assess the clinical risk. You calculate the PESI score or the simplified PESI score. If the patient fits into intermediate risk, then there is a sub classification as intermediate high or intermediate low risk. And the intermediate high risk of the population, which is nowadays uh, more and more incorporated in the trials and which is the region of interest for interventional cardiologists, because these are the patients in whom you can inter intervene either with a catheter-directed thrombolysis or mechanical thrombectomy or suction devices or ultrasound guided uh, devices for maceration of the thrombus. If it's an intermediate low risk, you can go for hospitalization, but you need just monitoring. You need to not be so aggressive in interventions. And if it's a low risk, you do not need to admit the patient at all. Consider for early discharge and home treatment if feasible. The treatment of pulmonary embolism, obviously anticoagulation, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, he would require some kind of respiratory support, a BiPAP or sometimes invasive ventilation. He would require hemodynamic support, fluids, inotropes, anticoagulation or any RV support devices if available. Anticoagulation is the, 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 you know, the primary treatment in any kind of pulmonary embolism. So parenteral anticoagulation has to be given vitamin K antagonists, the NOACs, the new oral anticoagulants, thrombolytic therapy, surgical embolectomy, percutaneous catheter direct treatment and venous filters. Anticoagulation therapy in patients with acute PE, it is recommended objective is to prevent both early death and recurrent symptomatic or fatal venous thromboembolism. The standard duration should cover at least three months. The guidelines ideally see that if it's the first episode of unprovoked DVT or uh, if it's provoked DVT or unprovoked DVT, the first episode, consider giving the patient anticoagulation for at least three months and preferably up to six months. So acute phase five to 10 days, standard duration, three months beyond extend beyond three months. So parenteral anticoagulation, when the patient is in hospital with either unfractionate heparin, low molecular heparin or fonda paranox, then for the long-term oral therapy, either consider warfarin or the Nuax and look at the provoked risk factors like say an oral contraceptive pills. In this patient, especially one thing I forgot to mention is the OC pills. Always take a detailed history of the patient's uh, OC pills, the, the menstrual status, which, uh, which can provoke or increase the risk of developing uh, venous thromboembolism and pulmonary embolism. So the provoked risk factor should be avoided. And obviously in those patients who have unprovoked DVT, you can consider continuing it for six months and then stopping it. But in this our case, when the patient is having a recurrent pulmonary embolism, there is without a question, a need for continuing the anticoagulation lifelong. Obviously warfarin has been replaced by the Novax for numerous reasons, unpredictable response, narrow therapeutic window, routine coagulation monitoring, frequent dose adjustments, slow onset and offset of action, numerous food drug interactions, numerous drug drug interactions, and risk of bleeding. The Novax, the oral DTIs, that is Dabigatron and oral factor 10 inhibitors, Rivaroxaban, Apexaban, and Eduxaban, we have multiple trials showing their benefit over warfarin, that they are equally efficacious and with less bleeding. So the dosing of dabigatron, you just need to look at the creatinine clearance, which is the absolute contraindication if it's less than 30. Otherwise, any patient who is more than 75 or the creatinine clearance between 30 to 50 or high bleeding risk, you may need to give a lower dose of dabigatron, which is 110 milligram bleeding. And if the patient is 
say uh, not having any of these factors, you can easily or safely give 150 milligram BD of dabigatron. Just make sure that the patient has to re receive heparin uh, for five days, either low molecular weight or unfractionated. And then you need to abruptly start dabigatron the very next day. Obviously, uh, as I said, the duration has to be descent depending upon whether it's provoked or unprovoked, whether it's the first or second episode of DVT or PE. Those of Epixaban, everyone is aware of it. Uh, 10 milligram twice daily to five, five to 10 milligram twice daily. Rivaroxaban is 15 mg twice daily, then 20 mg once daily. This is the 10 mg dose Epixaban for seven days and then five mg twice daily. This is the transition. How do you transition from an anticoagulation to a NOAC? So if the patient is receiving IV apparent infusion, if you want to stop or change to a NOAC, stop it and commence NOAC immediately. If the patient is Again, LM, receiving LMWH to NOAC, stop LMWH and commence the NOAC when the next dose is due. From warfarin to NOAC, stop warfarin, measure INR daily, wait, wait if it's less than, wait till it's less than 2.5 and then commence NOAC. And this is again switching from dabigatron to warfarin and warfarin to vice versa. If you want to switch from warfarin to dabigatron, obviously, as I said, INR should be less than 2 to 2.5 and then start dabigatron. And if you want to switch from dabigatron to warfarin, Recommend start of warfarin after squinting dabigatron three to one days, depending upon the creatine clearance. And these are switching from dabigatron to from parenteral and vice versa. And what is the discontinuation of dabigatron before scheduled surgery interventions? It should be one to two days before the procedure of the creatine clearance is more than 50. If it's less than 50, three to five days. And if required, address is which is the antidote of dabigatron. These are the clinical evidences. NOACs, obviously, much more superior, multiple randomized trials, less bleeding, equally efficacious. All the NOACs, Tabigatron, Rivaroxaban, Epixaban, Edoxaban. The guidelines have almost always advocated that in patients who have a requirement of long-term therapy, then you give either of the NOACs which you have over vitamin K antagonist therapy. The key message is that PE remains preventable and by combining patient presentation, clinical suspicion and scoring systems, the diagnosis may be streamlined and any patient who's coming with a recurrent DVT needs to be investigated thoroughly because uh, with the investigations that I suggested, because these patients would require lifetime anticoagulation, more aggressive monitoring. There is a little data also suggesting that those patients who have hypercoagulable state, some of the hematologists feel that warfarin is probably a better choice if the patient has had such recurrent DVT. But again, that is questionable. There is no trial comparing warfarin with dabigatron or rivaroxaban or epixaban in a patient who has had recurrent and uh, recurrent episodes of VT on any of the NOACs. So we need more data for the same. But obviously, the first choice would be a NOAC because these are much safer and much or equally efficacious as compared to the vitamin K antagonists. By streamlining transition of care, facilitating out of hospital treatment for NOACs are easier to use and because they're easier to use and safer than warfarin. Even if treatment in these patients start with MWH, you can always uh, switch from a NOAC to a NOAC or from NOAC to warfarin as and when required. And compared to VK, uh, vitamin K antagonists, NOACs are not only effective in treating PE, but they are also safer in terms of bleeding, thereby conferring clinical benefit. And we are, I think, still in uh, 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 in pulmonary embolism, the treatment of pulmonary embolism, we are in a stage where I think we are midway. The catheter-directed treatment is very exciting and is evolving day by day. And even the NOACs, I think they are becoming more and more efficacious. So I think it is better that NOACs replace VKAs, but uh, warfarin will still remain uh, a standard against which all the other things would be compared. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, today, we will discuss about the COVID-19 management in the cardiac patients. As we all know, SARS-CoV-2 causing coronavirus disease, COVID-19, reached the pandemic levels in the March 2020 and has caused repeated waves of outbreaks across the globe. COVID-19 says many manifestations of systemic disease and has major implications for the cardiovascular systems. Now, the many variants come um, uh, since last two years. The initial variants was the wild type of variants, which uh, that was the uh, first spike. The second spike was due to uh, Delta waves, and uh, now at present, the third wave is going on, and it's due to uh, Omicron variant. Um, the variant Omicron variant was first reported in by WHO in South Africa in November 2021 and uh, designated as variant of concern uh, and named after as Omicron in on 26 November 21. 
Now, the impact of the cardiovascular comorbidities on the COVID 19's outcome. The CV comorbidity are more common in the patient with COVID 19's. Presence of CVD is associated with the severe COVID 19 and uh, having a higher morbidity and mortality. CV risk factor are linked with the severe COVID 19 <coughs> infection and higher mortality. Now, what is the basic cardiovascular involvement in the COVID-19 infection? As we all know, SARS-CoV-19 viral invasion, which causes inflammatory and cytokine storm, which leads to myocardial damage. Um, uh, the viral invasion leads to also microvessels, uh, microvessels, microvessel thrombi, hypercoagulability, microvascular dysfunction, endothelial dysfunction, uh, plaque instability, plaque rupture. This all leads to acute coronary syndrome, uh, pulmonary embolism. Uh, myocardial damage leads to myocarditis, heart failure, and various type of arrhythmia because of myocarditis, COVID-19 infection, and various drugs used in the management of the COVID-19. Now, I want to share two uh, recent articles published in the NEGM, one which is on Molnupiravir for the oral treatment of the COVID-19 uh, OPD patients, uh, which shows the early treatment with the Molnupiravir reduced the risk of hospitalization and death uh, in COVID-19 infection, particularly in Omicron variant. Uh, second article is about uh, remdesivir, early remdesivir, three-day course of remdesivir uh, to prevent progression to severe COVID-19 uh, infection in OPD-based patient. Uh, Non-hospitalized patient who were at the high risk for COVID-19 progression, uh, three-day course of remdesivir had an acceptable safety profile and resulted in 87% uh, uh, reduction in the hospitalization as compared to placebo. Now, uh, uh, the recent guidelines the, regarding the management of the COVID-19 in the setting of Omicron variant, the Mount Sinai Health System Adult Treatment Guidelines, uh, uh, we discuss about something about uh, Mount Sinai guidelines, uh, which uh, suggest uh, if the patient is asymptomatic, only supportive care is the management uh, uh, of uh, <coughs> therapy uh, in Omicron variant. Uh, symptomatic patient not requiring oxygen supplementation and the uh, situation is more than 94 on the room air. Um, the treatment option uh, uh, so they suggested are the monoclonal antibody like short prolimab, which is not available in the India, and uh, antiviral drugs like molnupiravir, remdesivir, and Paxlovid. Uh, Paxlovid is also not available in India in the um, high risk group uh, who are symptomatic and uh, uh, at uh, room air situation is normal. Uh, in hospitalized, requiring low flow uh, nasal cannula, 4 liter oxygen, and SPO2 is less than 94 in the room air. The treatment option uh, they suggested having uh, uh, SARS CoV 2 specific antibody therapy, dexamethasone, and remdesivir. Uh, if in spite of remdesivir and steroid uh, deterioration, still deterioration in spite of 24 hour therapy with steroid, uh, considered for bericitimab and tocilizumab. Now comes to our patient. Our patient is 60 year old male, post CVG status, presented with COVID 19 with normal vitals with elevated inflammatory marker like CRP and D dimer. He is fully vaccinated but uh, had, has been nine months since the last shot. Uh, what will be approach to this patient uh, of COVID 19 and having CV morbidity? morbidity? Now uh, the uh, Basic treatment goes through um, uh, to assess the severity of illness with clinical examination and other inflammatory marker, treat according to the severity of the disease and rule out the, any cardiac complication precipitated by COVID like uh, arrhythmia, DVT and LVF. Uh, now what Indian guidelines suggest AIMS ICMR COVID-19 uh, guidelines uh, which revised on the 14th of January uh, 2022. Now, all the cases are uh, of uh, COVID in India is uh, Omicron variant and we should categorize the COVID-19 illness into three categories, mild disease, moderate disease and severe disease. Mild disease only home isolation and supportive care is the treatment of choice. Uh, in moderate disease, uh, like saturation is less than, 90, uh, less than 93 uh, on room air and respiratory rate more than 24 hours and symptoms of breathlessness. This comes to moderate disease and should be admitted in the ward. And the severe disease respiratory rate more than 30 per, uh, 30 per minute and SPO's uh, room air saturation is 90% uh, admitted in the ICU. 
now if we consider uh, in our case this uh, post cbg case uh, 60 year male uh, with ray crb and d dimer uh, if patient is asymptomatic no any uh, specific treatment relevant to covid is required only home isolation and supportive care like paracetamol and digestive treatment is the treatment of the choice if our patient is symptomatic then uh, uh, this patient comes into high risk category and uh, symptomatic like high grade fever persistent body ache fatigue and we should consider for early antiviral therapy uh, in initial days of illness uh, like uh, available molnupiravir or remdesivir remdesivir is the first choice to prevent progression because uh, as we discussed already in anegm trials it shows 90% almost 87 to 90% risk reduction uh, into progression to severe disease uh, if uh, patient develop uh, progression to disease and patient uh, develop hypoxia situation is less than 94 percent then we should consider for steroid methylprednisone or dexamethasone uh, dexamethasone uh, usually we give a 6 mg iv OD dose and uh, monitor inflammatory marker monitor h2 to level prone positioning and other psychosocial support therapy physiotherapy lung rehabilitation we should be supportive treatment in um, these cases and um, uh, if in spite of steroid and remdesivir, the patient is still deteriorating and the patient required a high flow nasal cannula or uh, NRBM and oxygen requirement is gradually increasing, we should consider for uh, tocilizumab or basic team like uh, Janus Kinase inhibitor uh, should consider in this patient. Uh, all other supportive treatment uh, like um, uh, uh, antibiotics in case of infection, bacterial infection, IV fluid management, psychosocial support, DVT prophylaxis. Uh, usually, when the patient having uh, oxygen requirement, we should consider for uh, prophylactic dose of low molecular weight dependent or conversion if to complement permanent thrombiabolism. Now, how we monitor these cases, like uh, we should do serial chest x-ray or uh, CRP dimer monitoring level to uh, show the result of, uh, to show the response of the steroids and to see uh, That's it. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. We have a 23-year-old male who presented with acute anterior wall MI for which he underwent successful primary PCI. And now he is keen to know why he had young CAD despite having no traditional risk factors. So our patient is basically asking that uh, whether this MI could have been prevented or not. So this bring in the uh, question of risk assessment. As our patient is very young and he's not having any traditional risk factors, we'll primarily focus on the non-traditional risk factors. So non-traditional coronary risk factors. Uh, myself, Dr. Pratik Rawal, I'm Associate Professor of Cardiology at UN Mehta Institute. So we all know that uh, cardiovascular disease are the leading cause of death worldwide. The atherosclerosis plaquing begins very early in the childhood and hence the key to prevent uh, uh, coronary events is to identify the individuals who are at risk. By the time patient present with an MI, it's already very late. And there are a number of uh, risk assessment tools that are available. Uh, importantly, Framingham risk score, ProCam risk score, WHO risk score, score system uh, that is provided by the European Society of Cardiovascular Disease, Q risk score. Another ones are Raynal, ACC, EHA, pool cohort equation, and Joint British Society three risk calculators. There are several limitations of this uh, risk assessment tool. Uh, the major, one of the major limitation is that uh, uh, what to do with the intermediate group. That means the patient who are having intermediate risk, uh, whether to start treatment in this group or not. Uh, we know that high risk patient uh, usually require a treatment in the form of uh, statin and aggressive risk factor controls like diabetes, hypertension, and low risk people generally do not require any intervention. But what to do with this intermediate risk group is not very clear. Uh, uh, with these uh, assessment tools. And uh, uh, many of the patients do not uh, have any traditional risk factors at all. And these tools do not incorporate uh, other non-traditional risk factors very well. Another important limitation is that uh, their validity in different ethnic groups and in certain patient population. For example, 
uh, there can be a substantial underestimation of risk, uh, particularly in, in individuals with chronic inflammatory diseases, HIV infection, socioeconomically uh, disadvantaged people, family fam patients with familial hypercholesterolemia, and those who are South Asians. Uh, these patient population are not very well represented in uh, various clinical trials of primary intervention. And uh, similarly, in some patient, uh, uh, this uh, scoring can uh, overestimate the risk, uh, like those with higher economic social class, particularly classic uh, uh, European and American patient, those who have continuous access to the uh, preventive services. Another limitation is that they are suboptimally calibrated for modern population. Uh, the studies from which these uh, tools have been derived uh, are conducted on older individuals, right? And the contemporary uh, patient population uh, we all know that the world has, uh, the lifestyle has changed significantly in the last two decades. So the applicability of this score in contemporary population is not uh, very well. And that is why we need, uh, that is why we need a uh, new risk markers, particularly to reclassify those individuals who, are, who fall in the intermediate risk category by these conventional uh, risk assessment tools. Uh, there are many uh, non-traditional risk factors. Uh, like biomarkers in blood and urine, uh, and notably HSCRP, lipoprotein A, homocysteine, etc., and various imaging tools like coronary calcium scoring, ankle brickel index, carotid intima media thickness, and uh, many psychosocial, environmental, and social determinants. We will discuss briefly important ones. So HSCRP is uh, probably uh, the most studied novel risk marker. Uh, it's no longer novel, but it's uh, still very important. It's an acute phase reactant and it uh, increases with all kinds of injury, infection, and inflammation. One of the important uh, feature is that uh, uh, the CRP levels are very stable in the circulation. It is not affected by the variation in meals and variation. Uh, there is no variation in circadian, uh, according to circadian rhythms. So the standard CRP assays determines only when the CRP is elevated uh, uh, manifold, like there is highly elevated CRP level, only then this uh, assays will uh, detect the CRP, like uh, those with infection and inflammation. But the HSCRP assays are particularly designed to detect the CRP level, which are within normal or uh, near normal range. Initially, CRP was known to be a risk marker rather than a risk factor, but there are certain data which indicate that uh, CRP may be an actual mediator of atherogenesis by causing endothelial dysfunction via decreasing uh, nitric oxide synthesis and increase in LDL deposition by uh, CRP mediated stimulation of macrophages. And uh, there are many data which shows that CRP does predict the first cardiac events. One of the study uh, that was conducted in 19, that was published in 1997 in NEGM clearly shows that there is linear correlation between relative risk of MI over a period of eight to 10 years as the CRP level increases. And similarly, there are many other studies that have shown similar findings that the relative risk of first cardiac events or first cardiovascular event increases as the level of CRP increases. And even among defined risk categories like Framingham, low, intermediate, and high risk, uh, increase in the level of CRP addition, gives additional information about the elevated risk. As the CRP level increases, the risk of first coronary events increases even in the same category. So is there any clinical evidence that inflammation can be reduced by preventive therapies like statin and other uh, therapies. This is one of the study that shows that the CRP level increases in a linear fashion as the BMI increases. So this implies that a simple weight reduction can reduce your CRP level and provide substantial protection. Another study shows that the statin therapy uh, reduces the CRP level. This is one of the study which was conducted in patients with low baseline LDL level, but with elevated or normal uh, HSCRP level. And between these two groups, it was seen that the statin were effective to reduce the risk 
in patients who had uh, elevated crp level at baseline jupiter was the landmark trial of rosua statin which conduct which was conducted on apparently healthy people who had elevated crp levels and this trial clearly showed a significant reduction in the primary endpoint that was composed of death mi revascularization and stroke there was 44% reduction of the uh, primary endpoint uh, in those with elevated crp level similarly secondary endpoint that was all cause mortality was also significantly reduced in patients with elevated crp level so despite uh, these evidence um, uh, the more recent data uh, latest one of the recent study that was published in jama uh, they assess various non traditional risk factors uh, they assess uh, whether these uh, uh non traditional risk factor whether they improve the risk classification in patients who already have traditional risk factors but these studies were not very convincing uh so that is why these uh, traditional risk uh, non conventional risk factors are not recommended in the current um, esc guideline it clearly recommends against using any kind of circulating or urinary biomarkers or even imaging test apart from cac calcium calcium coronary calcium scoring and carotid ultrasound other tests are not recommended homocysteine is another uh, risk marker it is an intermediary amino acid which is produced during conversion of methionine to the uh, cysteine this is the chemistry of uh, uh, folate metabolism we will not go into the detail one of the important causes um, important cause of uh, hyperhomocysteinemia hyperhomocysteinemia is mthfr deficiency that is uh, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase deficiency and homocysteine is very commonly elevated in generally population in general population and in those with vascular disease it can be it, it can be found elevated in as many as 20 to 40% of patients and folic acid deficiency seems to be the most common cause of hyperhomocysteinemia uh, the elevated homocysteine level they cause uh, oxidative injury to the vascular endothelium and impairs endothelium dependent uh, vascular uh, relaxation however there are many studies uh, uh, which have shown which have shown no benefit uh, in reducing homocysteine levels by folate supplements and other vitamin supplements so although uh, it seems to increase the risk uh, correction of homocysteine level doesn't offer any protection another uh, biomarker uh, is lipoprotein a which is probably uh, uh, well very well studied just like hscrp ldl is a uh, part ldl like uh, lpa is a ldl like particle and it has got a structural homology with plasminogen and that is how it's it's also an acute phase reactant um, and because of its homology to plasminogen it inhibits the every and it inhibits endogenous fibrinolysis it also inactivates tissue factor pathway inhibitor and it also localized within atherosclerotic lesion that is how it promotes atherosclerosis um, however there are studies which have shown minimal or no incremental predictive effects over the conventional risk factor and hence lpa is also not recommended uh, in the current uh, esc guideline although lpa has shown uh, to be a very good risk marker particularly for uh, indians in indians the levels of LD, uh, lpa is uh, particularly high as compared to other population and in our population uh, assessment of L lpa may be helpful so coming to the imaging uh, coronary calcium scoring is again uh, a method to assess subclinical atherosclerosis by quantifying coronary calcium it is not recommended uh, um, in the man below 40 years and women below 50 years of age so important feature of this is that there is a, a linear relationship with uh, elevated coronary calcium and annual mortality of cardiac of cardiac origin or mi that is roughly 2.8% annually that means it is 28% uh, over a 10 year period which uh, imparts very uh, high risk to the individual who have uh, elevated coronary calcium 
and as we can see the risk of coronary events increases in a linear fashion as the coronary calcium increases one of the main uh, utility of these study is to guide treatment decision in those patient who are having intermediate or borderline risk uh, means it act as a risk reclassifier it can upgrade or downgrade the risk in those who have uh, intermediate risk if the coronary calcium uh, uh, is uh, say more than 100 then uh, we can consider initiating statting and in those patient who have zero uh, coronary calcium score those individuals are not uh, are particularly at low risk for coronary events so in them we can uh, avoid initiating statin therapy another imaging modality is ankle brachial index very inexpensive uh, clinical uh, tool uh, a value of less than 0.9 or more than 1.3 uh, is shown to have uh, adverse uh, prognosis on cardiovascular health Another one is carotid intima media thickness. It is particularly helpful uh, when we want to avoid radiation and when the feasibility is not there, coronary, city coronary is not easily available. In that case, we can use carotid intima media thickness. A plaque is defined as a presence of focal wall thickening that is 50%, more than 50% of stenosis or as a focal region with an uh, intima IMT thickness that is uh, more than 1.5 mm is considered a plaque. And there are uh, many studies uh, that show that have shown that in intermediate risk patient, uh, the inclusion of carotid intima media thickness can lead to reclassification of those individual. And currently, it has been given a class two B recommendation, where CAC is not easily available. Psychosocial factors, which are particularly neglected. Um, uh, tools. There are many studies which have shown that the risk of cardiovascular events increases uh, in a linear fashion as the stress level increases and they uh, provide additional information independent of conventional coronary risk factors and the psycho uh, psychosocial stress include uh, not only the psychiatric illnesses like depression but also the uh, day to day stressors like uh, loneliness and uh, critical life events like death of any uh, keen person and uh, the current guideline has given a class 2 a recommendation above, above uh, even above the coronary calcium scoring uh, to assess the uh, stress uh, stress markers in a individual and in those with all those who already have established ASCVD they should be considered for referral to a psycho a psychotherapeutic stress management so this is a very important and not a very um, often uh, utilized tool. Another important uh, marker is ethnicity. We uh, Indians uh, by birth are at high risk of uh, CBD events. And the European guidelines clearly recommend uh, recommends multi multiplication by 1.3 for Indians and Bangladeshis and 1.7 for Pakistani. That means uh, when we are using the conventional tools and we calculate our risk by that tools, then we have to multiply that uh, risk score with 1.3. That will slightly increase our risk just by being Indian. Another very important but often neglected uh, risk marker is socioeconomic determinants. Low income and CVD mortality has been linearly associated and that has been found in various study. Low economic status is particularly very important feature for uh, our setup work related stress is also another important factor and it is determined by job strain that is uh, high demand and low control at work uh, often um, effort reward imbalance um, means in our country uh, day by day the competition level has increased in virtually all the field the best example is probably our own uh, medical field where work stress is very high and this is also an independent risk apart from the conventional risk factors. Very important environmental exposure, environmental air pollution, soil pollution, as well as noise pollution. The air pollution includes not only the particulate matter, but also the gaseous pollutants 
like nitrogen oxide ozone carbon monoxide and uh, in our country the indoor air pollution is also particularly important but still in rural areas uh, we use uh, people use fossil fuels like chulas and everything so the indoor uh, air pollution is also very significant similarly soil and water pollution is also important risk factor uh, because exposure to lead arsenic cadmium has been associated with uh, various uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases like hypertension cad stroke of particular importance is pm 2.5 particles that is the particles uh, who have got size of less than uh, 2.5 microns those particles do not uh, easily uh, suspend uh, do not easily uh, settle down on the ground and they remain suspended uh, in the air uh, we have commonly seen this during the winter months uh, particularly in the northern uh, part of our country and there is evidence that reduction of pm 2.5 is associated with improvement in inflammation thrombosis oxidative stress and decrease of ischemic events and the body of evidence is growing day by day uh, which is linking which is clearly linking in air pollution and cardiovascular mortality and that is why the current guidelines by european association uh, have recommended that those patients who are at very high risk of cvd should be encouraged to avoid long term exposure to the uh, area with uh, very high uh, air pollution and in regions where people have long term exposure to high levels of air pollution risk screening program should be considered on a regular basis uh, it also recommends uh, policy intervention at the population level like reducing uh, like taking uh, measures to reduce pm particles uh, uh, and uh, reduction of, um, of uh, utilization of fossil fuels like coal and promotion of uh, electric vehicles and everything fortunately our government has also taken steps in this direction uh, this is the uh, risk assessment tool by acc uh, latest 2019 acc ha uh, uh, pathway where acc ha recommends risk assessment right from the age of 20 years of particular importance is these borderline and intermediate uh, risk group where uh, we are not certain whether to start therapy or not in low risk there is no need to do anything in high risk patient we usually give statin but in this risk we do not know what to do so these novel risk factors should be utilized in these uh, category of patients where these are the various uh, risk uh, newer risk factors or we can or they nowadays call them risk enhancer like family history of premature cvd persistently elevated uh, ldl level chronic kidney disease metabolic syndrome and many others hscrp lpa level so in this category this can be used uh, the european guidelines uh, uh, recommend uh, routine uh, screening for uh, ascvd beyond the age of 40 while accch recommend it beyond the age of 20 um, and uh, this is one of the uh, risk assessment algorithm uh, that has been suggested particularly for indian patient in this uh, in this uh, tool they have included the lpa measurements in the primary assessment if the lpa level are elevated more than 50 then the individual is considered a very high risk straight forward and we can go ahead with statin therapy and those who are not meeting these criteria in those uh, further risk assessment uh, with uh, use of uh, with sub uh, measures of subclinical atherosclerosis like uh, coronary calcium scoring and carotid intima media thickness can be uh, used so young cad is uh, very common in india nowadays we are seeing patients in their third and fourth decade we no longer consider the patient who are presenting uh, in their fifth decade in their fifth decade uh, young anymore uh, that is how the worst uh, that is how worst situation is uh, and uh, th these young patients uh, very often they do not have any traditional risk factors and here is where the utilization of non traditional risk factor uh, comes into play because these risk factors are not uh, very well assessed uh, there are many people who undergo regular health checkups uh, where we conduct many unnecessary tests which are not uh, uh, required and doesn't give any additional information uh, as uh, as to the uh, ASCVD risk, uh, like psychosocial factors, stress, work-related stress, uh, economic condition, environmental pollution. These factors are not uh, uh, assessed um, in routine health checkups. Uh, 
so we need to uh, incorporate those factors during routine evaluation there is also a general uh, lack of awareness of um, healthy lifestyle uh, these other uh, recent guidelines have focused very much on the diet and uh, physical activity level but because of time constraint we have not uh, discussed those in detail but those are very important uh, part of prevention another uh, important issue is public health promotion by the state uh, uh, and uh, uh, clearly the government needs to do more uh, over and above uh, just showing the uh, statutory warnings in cinema halls and the most important thing is that we need to develop our own risk assessment tool that is very well tailored to the indian population which uh, takes into consideration the emerging risk factors particularly uh, stress uh, and um, environmental pollution so thank you thank you very much